Uh, yeah, no uh, public comment responses yet. Calling the January 12th regular meeting of the Fairfield Board of Education. I'm the chair, Christine Vitelli, and I'm joined tonight by Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Pitko, Mrs. Gerber, Superintendent Cummings, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Maxon Canelli, Mr. Peterson, and Ms. Guernsey. I ask you to all please rise for the pledge. Mrs. Maxon Canelli, will you lead us in the pledge? Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. I hope everybody had a, um, a restful, happy, healthy, and safe holiday. It's nice to be um, seeing everybody in person again. And um, 2021, we thought it was going to be a, off to a mild start, but it's already off to a, a tumultuous start. So looking forward to the year ahead and better things for, for all of us. Um, and what better night to celebrate that with a budget presentation? Before we uh, move on to the agenda, I'm just going to ask for the board's unanimous consent to move item 5A, approval of the Fairfield CARES Developmental Relationship Survey, up before our presentations. Seeing no objection, we'll just move that up to the agenda. Um, moving on to call in public comment, we have been advised that we do not have any call in public comment right now. For any members of the public who would like to give public comment, just a reminder, you can submit written public comment via the form on the Board of Ed website or by emailing us at public comment at fairfieldschools.org. So with that, moving on, approval of the Fairfield CARES Developmental Relationship Survey. Recommend a motion that the Board of Education approve the Fairfield CARES Developmental Relationship Survey. Can I have a motion? Mrs. Max Canelli, seconded by Ms. Jacobson. We are joined by Ms. Hazlett and Ms. Fazio. Does anybody have any questions, any additional questions on the survey? Do you ladies have anything else to add? Yes, I just, I'm not sure which microphone I'm supposed to speak into here. Oh, and just okay. introduce Good yourself for the record. Yes, I'm Kathy Hazlett. I'm the Fairfield Cares Coalition Coordinator. And I wanted to um, clarify just one thing, I, what was sent out to you for this meeting was the supplemental questions, options. We didn't know which option the Search Institute was going to agree to. We've done supplemental surveys um, every year that we've done the search survey. And because we're introducing a new survey this year, there was some back and forth as to the whole idea of a supplemental. Um, so we gave search two options. Um, the first option, option A, which was agreed to by search, is very similar to the supplemental surveys that we've done in the past. It's actually a little shorter, um, but it gets to the access questions that are just so important for us as prevention specialists to know where teens are accessing various substances. So I just wanted to clarify that um, because what you received was option A or option B, we are actually doing option A. So thank you. Does anybody have Mrs. Maxa Canale? Um, just as a reminder, and I, I know you covered this at the last meeting, but that seems like a long time ago. Um, if, if you can describe the, the time, the turnaround time it takes to get this back, and then what is what does it look like in terms of the interaction with the school district for sharing the information? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the survey is online, so students will receive a link and we'll have unique identifiers um, there because there are some questions that are only for high school students to complete versus middle school they, the high school students will receive a different link than the middle school students and it's it's done within you know a certain period on a given day um, and the turnaround time should be fairly quick i'd say within two weeks something like that to get the data back um, Search has been doing this for years. And then absolutely, um, once we compile it in a, the way that, that we want to present it, we will make a presentation back to the board as far as the results of the survey. 
and just I assume, I mean, obviously, we'll get kind of the big picture as opposed to necessarily all of the nitty gritty. Is there also any kind of interaction with staff in the district for anything more specific or is the presentation to the board something we would have staff attend so that they hear it? No, we can do that too. I mean, we certainly um, can do a presentation to staff most definitely. So it's whatever time permits, we're, we're happy to provide that information as well as to do a community presentation. So all parents and community members are aware of the survey results. Yes, absolutely. I, I would only add um, that one of the uh, commitments I've made in working with Fairfield Cares is, uh, and I've seen Mr. Jacobson, for example, last uh, summer, I think now, I think, shared a wealth of information from previous surveys that Cares had, had conducted that, to my knowledge, really have not uh, helped inform the goals of the district. So I think this is a tremendous opportunity as we go forward and we think about the district improvement plan as well as other goals that it might be more level specific. Um, it's a great opportunity to take that information and, and to begin to act on it. Yeah, I might add too, in addition to the survey results, I'm hoping that we can actually do workshops with staff and youth serving organizations, even parents, um, with the results of the survey. So it's not just presenting the results, but it's actually doing something with them and doing some training you know, to improve whatever we find. Yeah. Any other questions? And I will just speak as past PTA president that in the past those survey results were very valuable. I encourage PTAs to, to take you up on that offer to hold workshops that informed a lot of PTA programming over the years. And we led to some really, um, know very valuable and interesting discussions among parents just to getting to know some things about their kids who thought they knew their kids and were a little bit surprised about some of the things were going on so thank you for this work and for joining us again tonight um, and seeing no other further questions we'll bring it to the board for a vote all in favor it is unanimous motion carries 9-0 thank you thank you all very much I so appreciate this Okay, moving on, presentation and first reading of Tomlinson Middle School Solar Project Proposal. Mr. Morabito, I don't know if you have anything to present. Welcome. Um, do you, the board received the, um, the backup and the presentation in our packets. Um, I don't know if you have any opening remarks or I'll get out of the way and you can present. And just speak your name for the, and okay. position for the record. Oh. Uh, my name is Bob Wall. I'm the new chair of the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. And I'm Mary Hoag, I'm the secretary. Okay. Great, so um, we're here presenting uh, on behalf of Green Skies, but the task force has been in close consultation with the, uh, the school facility department, Green Skies, uh, Parks and Rec, and, and others in connection with this project. So a, a little background about Green Skies. Uh, they are a Connecticut-based installer, uh, one of the largest uh, solar developers in the country. In fact, they have the largest portfolio of commercial installations that they maintain of any installer in the country. And they've dealt with uh, more than 40 municipalities in Connecticut. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to uh, provide the cues. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Here you can see uh, at the top a, a representation of uh, some of their commercial clients and on the bottom uh, uh, just a handful of the municipalities, including Fairfield. Um, so as you can see, they've done a lot of work with schools around the state. And on the bottom right, you can see our lovely Fairfield Ward High School, one of their larger installations. Next slide. So they've been working with us here in Fairfield since, since 2013. 
and they are a very big supplier of our uh, solar. They've given us over uh, 3,000 megawatts of solar projects to date. And as you can see on the bottom, those are the solar installations that we have in town. And on the bottom is the proposed Tomlinson solar car parts. So Green Skies is a local company. They're based out of North Haven. So anything that goes wrong, they're very local and can get to us quickly. And they, um, their operations and maintenance is in-house 24 hours, seven days a week. And they will be providing two visits in spring and fall to inspect all the arrays and components. And they perform all their warranty work in-house with their own technicians based out of their North Haven headquarters. Next slide. And here's our project overview. Here you can see uh, an actual photo, and what you probably can't see too clearly is the uh, locations uh, to the roughly to the south and southeast of the uh, school uh, where the carports would be. Oh, yes, Mary was kind enough to bring a uh, little pointer if we can get it to work. There it is. Is there a question or? There or and there. Yeah. Sorry, it's just flaky. And part of our, part of our conversation with uh, Anthony Calabresi at Parks and Rec had to do with issues relating to the aerial ropes course, uh, and uh, the carport will not impact that ropes course in any way, and similarly, it will not. Um, impact uh, athletic activities on the field. Uh, he did ask if uh, it was possible to include a, a barrier along the fence because over time they're often dealing with cars that uh, overshoot things and uh, damage the fence. Um, that is not part of the current proposal, but the developer is open to modifying it and it did not believe it would have a significant impact on uh, any costs. Next, next slide, please. So here is the money shot. Um, this, is, this would be a 25-year power purchase agreement. Uh, for those unfamiliar with power purchase agreements, it's become a, a popular and almost standard method of municipalities to obtain solar for no money down, and uh, they pay uh, out based on the electricity produced uh, at a, in this case, it's a fixed rate of 10.7 cents per kilowatt hour, which is nearly two cents less than the current rate uh, offered uh, to the town of 12 and a half cents. And so this uh, chart shows the potential savings over the 25 year period. And they have assumed a uh, conservative 3% uh, utility rate escalator over time uh, th that is you know, consistent with the industry standards. Um, and uh, this shows the savings. Uh, in, in year one, it's relatively modest at about $4,400. But over time, that grows uh, significantly. And the, the total savings is uh, over $400,000. And I should point out that uh, from the time that we first uh, started talking about this system, they were able to increase the wattage of the carports, uh, and it resulted in another potential $90,000 of savings to the town. Next slide. Next slide. So here we are down at ground level, and this is a rendering of what it would look like as you're walking um, on the parking lot. So you can see um, how the how it would look. You can see from above. You can see the the solar panels, and then you can see below. I think the next. Oh, sorry, sorry, because I didn't push the button. This is what it looks like from ground level. 
on the top, and then uh, you can see the panels from above. If you go to the next slide, you can see that uh, just like all the other solar car parts we have in town, that the fire um, trucks and the school buses can fit underneath. And um, it, these renderings don't have the fences that are, are there, um, but they will still be there. Um, so it meets all the specs that we have always asked for, and um, it's the same if you want to see what a carport looks like. It's going to look just like the carports that we have at the high schools, the Burr School. They're the same exact specs. Um, it'll have the uh, LED lighting. It'll have the uh, security cameras that are going to be tied into the schools and the police departments. So it'll be all the same specs that we've asked for. It'll have the snow shields. Um, so it's everything that we've always been getting in the past. Um, next slide. Um, so this is Tomlinson as we know and love it now with the train stations down along the bottom and the field there. And then the next slide is. Oh. Yeah, just, just to hit a few more points on uh, the, the miracle of the power purchase agreement. Uh, what's really important is that this allows um, the owner of the system to uh, obtain the 26% federal tax credit that the town of Fairfield would not be eligible to receive. So those savings are passed on to the town through the power purchase agreement rates. And uh, it's also financed in part uh, by um, something uh, achieved through the zero emission renewable energy credit, uh, commonly known as ZREC. Uh, and they were able to get a, a, a very favorable price uh, for that, which helps the town. Um, one other point that we wanted to uh, emphasize is that uh, there will be no EV chargers or electrical outlets uh, at this particular system. We know in the past that's caused some uh, angst uh, at, for certain parties, but uh, it's not part of this proposal. And currently, uh, this was prepared assuming uh, March 2021 execution date of the PPA. Uh, we are scheduled, assuming uh, this board approves uh, the project to go forward, we're scheduled to go before the Board of Selectmen in February, and we may be able to accelerate that uh, execution date, which would help uh, the other events to uh, occur earlier. But currently, the construction would uh, take place in in the summer, and it's scheduled to be concluded uh, by the end of September. And I also wanted to point out in the board packet, we prepared a, a fact sheet along with a, uh, a growing list of frequently asked questions. Uh, but if you have any additional questions, we're happy to uh, try to take them on. Sal, did you want to add anything? Okay. Thank you for that presentation. And the questions were, um, were helpful, have it in the presentation, because they have been asked many times before. But with that, we'll take it to the board, Mr. Peterson. Hi, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I, so, I just want to say first that I, I think that this is a great spot for the project. Think about some of the objection, objections that I've had to other uh, of these carport projects. Look, there's, there's no neighbors, you know, there's, there's no scenery, there's, it'll screen better from Metro North. I, I think it's a fantastic site. Um, I, I did have a couple of other questions, though. One maybe for Mr. Morabito. Um, I understand from the Board of Finance that the town is conducting an audit right now of solar facilities to make sure that we have gotten the savings that we've been promised. And, that, and at the same time, uh, in this report that I, I has not been released, but I understand is going to be released in February, uh, is talking a little bit about some possible improvements to the contract process. Is that anything that you've been involved in or have heard about? Uh, I've heard about the audit. Um, I, I've been asked questions about, um, you know, what we see on our side, on the Board of Ed side, as far as um, the PPA. As far as uh, the resolution on it, there's, I, I believe they're still uh, dialoguing back and forth with the uh, Deputy Director of Public Works on that. And 
the final document is, as you said, supposed to be coming out next month. Um, basically, I believe that all of our systems are good for the uh, standards that they're setting. I, okay, I mean, I just, I, I, I don't have a good sense because I only know that this report exists and is being produced, whether this is premature in coming to us. I'm just going to throw that out at this, because I, I, I have no idea what the content of this report is or what its conclusions are about savings and, and, and process. Um, but, you know, we're talking about you're moving, moving faster. I, I wonder whether we should take a, take a breath. Right. The, the point of the uh, audit, as far as I understand, is what do you measure the savings against? And I believe at 10.7 cents, um, it's well below any of the markers that they're talking about as far as the hurdle to, uh, or the standard to, to match it to. Uh, right now, it's set at, um, we compare it to 17 cents a kilowatt hour. This is set to compare at 12 and a half, and it's below that. So sure. uh, it's just a matter of how they calculate how much savings we have uh, for what's uh, uh, not our kilowatts, but our uh, overall demand charge. There's two char basically two charges in an electric bill, right. the actual usage and what's called the demand charge. And this demand charge is a substantial portion of the bill. How much of that do we account that we're saving? And that's the point of the audit as far as I understand it. Okay. Uh, just and, and maybe to, to uh, the chair, is this anticipated that this will be on our, uh, on what I think the, the last regular meeting in January? Would be, or we would be on the last, the January 28th meeting for a vote. So I guess we can find some more information, you know, um, reach out to the Board of Finance. I think that for us, we can move it forward. It does need to go before the Board of Selectmen as well. I think if the town, other town bodies have concerns about moving it forward at this time. No, I understand, and I'm also cognizant of what our role in this is yeah. in this process. I'm just trying to cross all the, no, I all the T's. Um, a couple of other quick questions. Um, I was wondering, you know, I didn't realize this until I saw, I, I, I was watching the presentation. I don't know why it didn't click to me before. We, we have multiple carport projects in town, for example, at the high schools, but those, those aren't, those weren't produced by this Green Skies company. And, and if, and if not, wh why didn't we choose the, uh, the, the contractor who had previously done carports? The, uh, the, the projects are, uh, as you saw the reference to the ZREF, that is through a uh, competition on the state level and different ESCOs, energy service companies, will provide uh, proposals to the state and it just so happened this is the one that Green Skies won. The other one is Skyview that built the carports that we do have. Um, uh, Green Skies has built the carports for the town of Fairfield. They have not built them for the Board of Education. Gotcha. Um, and they're a known entity. They also built our solar projects on top of uh, both high schools on the roofs and Woods Middle School. And but this isn't their first carport project. Uh, I guess it's kind no of what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm heading toward here. All right, so they're, they're, no, not, it is not. they're not using us as a guinea pig. To, you know. All right, I'm sorry. I probably should have just asked that question to begin with. Um, and, you know, and one thing, again, that, that occurred to me, just I, I don't know why this didn't come to my mind earlier, think about these solar purchase plants. What happens, Tumleton is an old building. What happens if during the course of this contract, we cease using Tomlinson for a school for whatever reason? What's, what's our obligation at that point? I don't have the direct language on that. There, there is, um, I believe it's a 25 year plan and we're supposed to buy 25 years worth of electricity produced by this project. So the building still needs electricity. So if it's turned back over to the town, it's, you know, it's not running the whole building. It's only running a fraction of the building. No, I understand. I just, the, the, the scenario that's occurring in my mind, again, and I don't, I don't want to suggest at all that we're considering doing anything to Tomlinson, but it's an old school. If, if circumstances change and, you know, 20 years is a long time, we decide to, the town wants to tear that building down and put up a, a brand new senior center or something, um, or something that for which this installation w wouldn't be site appropriate. 
I guess what are our, what's our recourse? And, and if you don't have that, that the answer to that question, I just, I, 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 I might incur encourage the Board of Finance to ask that question. I just, I, I'm thinking a lot about uh, what the uses of our buildings are gonna be over the next 20 years, and that's, that's a long period of time with the stock of buildings that we have. Uh, we'll have to get you that answer for, for next time. I don't, I do not have that answer. No, oh, I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks very much. Mrs. Gerber? Um, yeah, thank you uh, very much for this uh, presentation. Um, I guess one question I had, um, and obviously right now in January with what we're dealing with, it's, it's hard to say, but when we're talking about possible construction going into the school year, into you know August and September, if you know the first day of school is supposed to be August 30th, I believe. Um, and I also know that you know sports, uh, soccer uses the Tomlinson turf field. Um, I've driven in and out of there many, many times over the years, and it really is a tight, that back area is really kind of tight, and I'm just cur curious if there are any concerns about now with this additional structure there, if it will make it that much more so, and then also how will this potentially impact or how can we work around if there are gonna be sporting events taking place in you know the beginning of the fall when this construction is still going on. We, we spoke about the construction running into September. Uh, typically at, by the time, we had a similar timeline also with, with Burr. And what's being done at that point when school is in session is what's called the string wiring from panel to panel. Um, so that work can be done by blocking off only a, a, a few parking spaces at a time and then moving on. So they would block off, say, five parking spaces, and that's all we have to worry about losing while they're doing their work. And then we would move down along the array until we get it all done. It's, it's not something that's uh, um, extremely um, cumbersome for the staff. Uh, there aren't parking spaces or established parking spaces at the end zone of the field. So actually finding some extra parking spaces or temporary parking spaces is relatively easy. So the, the work is not um, invasive once the school year is coming and, and we can work around it. Yeah, and, and again, I, I could really be getting ahead of myself with where we are right now, but you know, I know usually Labor Day weekend in the past has been the FUSA soccer tournament, which is a huge soccer tournament, and the, the turf field at Tomlinson is used all day, and there are cars in and out of there constantly. So it's just something to keep in mind. I mean, I'm not saying it would be a reason not to do this, but just that is a pretty big deal, and whether or not there actually will be a FUSA tournament this Labor Day, I, I'm sure none of us can say right now, but that was just something that crossed my mind. Having pulled in and out of there multiple times over the years, I just thought if there are gonna be a lot of construction materials there over that time, it could be problematic. So it would just have something that would have to be factored into the planning, that's all. Yes, we, we can work that in. We also can work with the uh, uh, parking authority to use spaces in the uh, train station. Ms. Pitko. So I'm not sure who this question is directed at. I, and I know this is a different uh, company. The uh, car solar carport at Burr, is it actually functioning? Are they getting solar energy from it? Yes, they are. Okay, because uh, the people that had given the presentation on that, I had actually seen them, and they weren't sure that we were actually generating electricity, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, we've been generating electricity, I believe, since November. Ms. Jacobson? Um, hi, thank you, Jen Jacobson. Um, two quick questions. One, um, knowing how heavily used that Tomlinson Field is, I'm a little concerned how close that carport is to the turf. So I'm asking about the barrier option. Um, when you spoke to Mr. Calabrese, or did he in indicate to you that that might be a good idea? Or And I'm also curious, if so, how high? Would it go above the football goal posts? Um, so just maybe not answers for tonight. I know that Green Skies pays for replacement panels should a rogue ball. It's built for up to golf ball, apparently, um, weight, so to speak. Um, but there are a lot of other balls used on that field, whether in an organized or unorganized manner. So just putting that out there that, and if you could speak to any experience that you have in other towns where it's right up against a turf field at this point, 
Is it just the damage is what I'm speaking to um, experience there? Ward is up against the fields. Yes, it's up against a grass field, but not necessarily a turf where you might have you know harder balls being utilized. Um, Ward, Ward has its fair amount of um, broken panels, uh, baseballs from, from the from the hardball field. Um, it is part of the PPA, the maintenance and replacement. It's totally on them. So they, they are aware of the hazard of having it close to a field and it's in their model and they pay for that maintenance and those replacements. Okay, great. And then the second question that I had is just piggybacking on Mr. Peterson's comment, um, just that Tomlinson is an older building. And I know we did have some issues, you know, obviously with a different company, I think with Ward, with the electricity, you know, being compatible and running it. Do we know for a fact at this point that Tomlinson's electrical system and whatnot can handle what it would require to function properly? Yes, the system, the system is designed by an electrical engineer. Uh, the problem at Ward was not with the, the PV system, was not with the solar system per se. Uh, it was a latent problem uh, elsewhere in the building and had some odd ramifications, but it wasn't, it wasn't the solar system that, that caused that. No, no, I, d I know that. I just wanted to make sure that they were compatible at this point. Okay, thanks so much. Mr. Asa? Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, <coughs> I, I think I've, you know, spoken openly on this, on, on these projects in the past, on how hideous and ugly I think they are. Um, I am a fan of renewable energy and solar. I do like the idea of it. Um, but when we put these truck stop-like structures um, in areas where people can see, um, I, I do think they're eyesores. And, you know, while Mr. Peterson makes a good point where it's not interfering with neighbors, it is, it is very visible for the people that come to that field, to play on the field, um, come to our town to visit. Um, so I, I just put that out there um, as a personal note. Um, again, I'm not against solar, um, but I am not a fan of these structures. Um, one question for Mr. Morbido. Um, I do have some concerns with the placement of the carport um, facing the railroad tracks. If I'm correct, we, we do know of a, an issue that will need addressing with an underground pipe there eventually. Um, and I'm curious as to how this structure may come into play eventually when that needs to be taken care of. You're talking about the culverts underneath the railroad tracks? Uh, yes. Well, we're, we're st there, there is a distance. You know, we have all of Project Adventure. There, there's quite a distance between this par these parking spaces and the railroad track where those culverts actually are. Um, there, but also any piping that might have to come back to all the way back to structures in the parking lot, we have wide spacing between the foundations on these structures, you know, 30 to 35 feet. So there's plenty of room for routing. It's a design exercise. Where, where do you actually place the pipe in that parking lot or between those piers? So that's something that would be, um, I don't want to say easy, but that's, that's one of the more minor ones. The bigger ones are high voltage uh, transformer lines that are running parallel to that would be a bigger design problem for that, uh, that particular item that you're concerned about. Okay, because I, I would like to know, um, we know you say it's a design issue, but I'm putting it on the spot here. Um, you know, a design issue can come with costs. And I would just be curious if you could get us that information before the next meeting as to what our potential liability cost-wise could be for having to route something if we needed to one way or the other. So if you could get that information, that would be great. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, bring it to the town engineer to see what his uh, concerns would be with those structures in place. And, you know, finally, I just, you know, I, I do, I, I'm glad that, the, that Mr. Peterson raises that the BOF is, is doing an audit on this um, because I am curious as to what kind of savings we are and what's our ROI and what's the cost involved um, with putting these structures on our properties and what the real return is. I mean, in, in year one of $4,400, you know, like you said, it's, it's very small, but towards the end of the term, it's big. 
Um, but I, I won't lie that I, I do have some reservations about this um, project. And uh, if, if I can think of anything else, I'll get them um, emailed to you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. And this will be on our uh, regular meeting agenda at the end of the month. If any, the board members have any questions between that time, just please um, forward them to Mr. Cummings. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Presentation of the superintendent's proposed 2021-2022 operating budget. Mr. Cummings. Oh, good evening, everyone. Mike Cummings, superintendent. We're going to just take a minute to get the um, projector set up, the um, computer set up, and get the uh, presentation out to board members. Superintendent's uh, uh, budget. I want to begin first by thanking um, the uh, building administrator staff who contributed to the development of the budget. Um, thank you. Uh, as well as the central office uh, staff, the executive directors uh, have spent um, a tremendous amount of time working with this budget um, over the past two months, essentially. Um, winnowing it down, I, I want to say at the outset that we had a number of very, um, very valuable um, and important requests from staff that we were not able to um, do more than um, philosophically support um, because of the concerns that this budget raises, particularly in light of the economic times that the state and town is facing. Um, I want to reiterate something I try to say every year. Um, the development of a budget um, is, the state, is a, a statement of values. It is a statement of um, what a district, in this case, a school system, believes to be the most important 
um, function and serving its role for students and its community. And that is not only the things that um, you're going to spend money on, but it's the decisions upon which you will not spend money and decisions around how much a system, school system can actually support to fulfill the promise of that spending. Um, so we, tonight's presentation, again, is to go over, give you a high level view of the budget. And as we'll talk about at the end of tonight's presentation, we'll, we'll review um, the next steps uh, going forward for the board in, in reviewing and getting into more depth, more detail on the, on the proposed budget. We're not rolling. Okay, so our district goals are drawn from our 2021 school improvement plan. Um, one of the things is we've talked about in, um, in our fall meetings around development of this year's plan, like so many things this year have been um, held up by our uh, needed response to the COVID pandemic. Um, I do want to point out, though, that one of the one of our central tenants was as we worked with staff in developing um, budget expectations was getting a sense of where we needed to go as a district. So I think that um, not only does the the 2021 school improvement plan, excuse me, district improvement plan point to future objectives of the district. Um, today's budget, tonight's budget. Um, also reflects where we're where we intend to head in the but in our um, district work. So um, I won't read all this to you, but I want to point out a couple. Uh, the second bullet: identifying methods to promote anti-racism in the work of the school system. Rooting instructional practices and adapting curriculum standards. And improving the district's internal and external communications. We'll talk again in more detail as we go through the budget. Um, in the coming weeks of uh, how this plays out in specific instances where you'll see this information. Doctors have a chance to ably assist. Um, so this is truly a year of reflection. Um, as we talked about in the uh, in November and December when we were beginning to have conversations about the development of this budget, one of the things that we did from a very practical matter was we assumed several things. One, we assumed that um, while there is hope that the pandemic will be coming to an end, we're taking uh, the advice of experts that say, that say to us that September, October, we may still find ourselves uh, in wearing masks and engaging in other mitigation strategies um, to maintain safety. Um, so that's just one of the things that we looked at. You will see COVID spending in this year's budget or in the proposed budget, excuse me, but you will not see the full throttle expenses that we are currently doing in 2021. For example, and I'll repeat this later, but the RLA will not be in place in 21-22. Um, but again, you're going to see some uh, expenses, expected expenses for things like masks, sanitizer, those types of things. Um, and I want to point out, oh, well, we can go, just go back one second. I want to point out the last bullet. Um, in the past couple of budgets, we've had to look to our school al per pupil allocations to make reductions. One of the commitments we made um, in last January was that in this budget, the proposed budget, 21-22, we, we would restore our per pupil allocation back to its 17-18 level. So that's still, at this point, three years old, but we didn't want to make any further cuts. And you'll see, I'll point out tonight a couple places where you'll see that increase show up in, in different accounts. So our budget, our budget increase is 5.32%. That is our request. For a total budget of $194,316,444. And I'm going to break that number down for you uh, right now. So, uh, this is uh, one of the things we wrestled with as we developed the budget 
was the narrative. You know, um, it not only is it a complex year, it was a complex spring. It was a complex budget um, negotiation back in the spring, late uh, May and June with the town. And um, a lot has happened in the intervening months. So part of the narrative is, the, the purpose of the narrative is to help people, re one, remember, and two, explain kind of how we are, where we are, um, so that we can help promote the story going forward and help people understand why that number is 5.32%. So quick refresher course. In our 1920 budget, because of the shutdown, we had $3.6 million in savings. We also had, because buses didn't run, a transportation credit from our transportation providers of $1.03 million. So that's how we kind of ended the 1920 school year budget. In working with the town, we did a couple of things. Um, one, the town cut the $1.03 million credit that we got as, a, uh, the, excuse me, that, the transportation credit, that was cut from our budget. And then of the $3.6 million in savings, um, we cut 1.5, well, 3.6, let me start over again. 1.52 million was cut from maintenance and 2.1 million was put into the non-lapsing account. Therefore, in, when we come back now to the developing the 21-22 budget, we have the money that was put into the non-lapsing account is not in our current budget. It's being paid out of essentially 1920 funds. But we have to fill back in that hole that was created when that money was put into the 20, into the, the 1920 money was put in, was, the 2021 money was taken out and the 1920 money was used to replace it. One of the things we talked about today when we were reviewing this is um, what's difficult to understand or uh, think about with this sometimes is that you di we didn't see the impact of the budget cut last May and June because the budget was cut, the money was used, two things happened. One, we had the credit from the transportation company to go forward. And two, we had the uh, non-lapsing account to cover that, the uh, experience of losing the money. Where you see it is now as we develop the, the 21-22 budget. You're gonna have plenty of experience with this story in the months ahead, <laughs> okay? And you're gonna find yourself telling it to other people, um, but it's, this is just, well, and this is only our first iteration through it. But this is the important thing to remember as we think about where we are with the budget, that the, um, the difference, and it's, you can see it at the bottom of the slide, the difference in what we're making up for accounts for 1.39% of our 5.32% request. Okay, so the 5.32% is a real number. 1.39% of that, or not, I shouldn't put it that, I should, of the 5.32%, 1.39% is based on replacing or restoring this hole that was created back during the budget negotiations in the spring, in which the board signed an MOU with the board, with the town to, because this was the best way forward at the time um, for the town, okay? Where you'll see um, this show up particularly is the funding that those reductions were done in operations and maintenance and in transportation. So we highlight that on this slide, um, and I'll briefly because you're gonna see it again on the next slide, but the highlighted portions, these were the accounts most greatly impacted by the creation of the non-lapsing account and the cut in transportation. Yep, sorry. Um, so on the next slide, you will see a comparison of how the increases in these accounts change when the non-lapsing account impact is taken out. So note that the operations and maintenance, operations and maintenance here is 1.66% of that 5.32. Uh, 
but take out that out and in, in what we, we classify um, and I apologize for even referring to it this year way but as a normal year um, you'd see that the increase would be 0.27% in those two accounts okay so the, the great amount of the driver and the increase in those accounts is the making up for last year's reduction and we'll break this out into detail obviously as we go through and you ask your questions and we have discussions at our workshops so let's talk about the major drivers I'm not these are the, the slides that um, try as I might I cannot find narrative for so um, we let the numbers speak for themselves our major driver increases here obviously as always the benefits and salaries operation and maintenance and the transportation costs as we just talked about one of the things always to keep in mind is that uh, as we look at percentages it's important too to reference the um, dollar increase that goes with it because as you'll see as we get to some upcoming slides those percentages are going to look absolutely crazy but the dollar amounts don't necessarily match the craziness of the percentage increase We have a couple of requisite pie charts in tonight's presentation. Um, this is basically just breaking out the budget salary by group. And we'll show, I think it's the next slide. Yes, if you can do where we are with our um, contractual increases with the special ed trainers being approved um, hopefully tonight as an agenda item. So if you look, this is where your percentage increases look a little bit nuts. Um, if you look at maintenance, repairs, and supplies, um, I won't even attempt it. 47,799.2% uh, increase in that account. Um, that again ties back to w earlier conversation about um, how we addressed last year's um, budget. And again, we'll break this all out for you in, in the coming conversation. And again, a similar uh, level of increase in student transportation. Okay. Um, I want to point out on this. Um, like this, so the student activity expense there, that's a direct uh, result of increasing the, of going back and increasing the per pupil allocation. So the student activity expenses is very much a building based um, increase. And on the next slide, you'll see this in supplies, techs, and materials. As the buildings had more money to spend this year, those, those two areas were the greatest uh, impact for that additional fund for the school. I promise you we will hunt down that two hundred ninety nine dollars <laughs> um, the next next series of slides is our targeted enhancements and um, I'm not going to go over these tonight I thought that given past practice we will begin our first workshop next Tuesday night with these and I'll have the the executive director speak to ones that are specific to their work um, but I wanted to have the, you to have these in advance um, in case there was questions or that you had for them that you wanted to ask prior to next Tuesday's meeting. Um, but essentially, as I said at the very beginning, um, we, we were driven by a couple themes this year as we were trying to think about, uh, we were actually driven, let me, let me talk about three themes. One, always starting with, what's the basic operational budget you need to run the school system successfully um, to promote health, safety, and learning for all students? And then two, where can you look for the things that need, to, wh what are the things that need to get better and how do you address those? And how do you address those in a way that is realistic to what actually can be accomplished? 
So um, reducing, in a sense, the size of your dreams to what, what can get done, not only for the thing that you're working on, for that specific component, but how it, how it balances against the other things that you want to do. So it's not just that one person might have to limit their, um, their, their dreams a bit. We also have to balance all those dreams against each other and say, what can the school system actually support to ensure success of those initiatives? So what you'll see here on these slides is a series of some, some smaller and some bigger actions that are attempts that we believe we can fully support with both dollars and most of all, the capacity to success to bring improvement to the school system. So one of the, I'm only gonna highlight the first one really quickly. Um, this is really a cooperative activity between Mr. Mancusi and the special ed department, but also in consultation and work with Dr. Savichancic and, and the instructional division around how we are going to address learning, reading early literacy needs across the district. Um, we've talked about this when we were talking about the Giant Steps property but essentially how can we do more to support our students and in the long run begin to reduce costs across the district, tuition costs specifically. Um, and then there's other things. We, we looked at how do we improve capacity across for our uh, teacher leaders. The first bullet here, the teacher residency program is something we're gonna get engaged with um, to support um, greater diversity in our hiring practices in the district. Okay. So again, we will start our conversation uh, next Tuesday night with a, a further review of those. Um, staffing. So uh, what I want to point out here is, uh, again, something we worked on today, and I hope this is helpful to you. Um, but essentially what we looked at was we have, we, because of the complications of this year, we tried to show the staffing changes two different ways. One was the actual to the 2021 actual to 21-22 proposed, and the, and the other was the 2021 budget to the 21-22 proposed. So if you look at in-person learning in pink there, right, that's the 2021 budget was 1,024.55 FTE. This is certified, excuse me. Um, and then what actually happened is in blue, right? And, and the, but the difference, going back to the pink, the difference between the 1,026 in yellow and the 124, 1,024.55 is actually that 1.45 at the bottom. So the budget to budget comparison is a 1.45 increase in FTE on the actual to the proposed, it's a 1.925. And that you get that by adding the two numbers in blue. And as we talk about again back in the fall, the reallocation of staff, existing staff from the buildings to the RLA is uh, those numbers in blue. I also wanna point out we have um, those one year contracts. So those are off the table as of next year. We did not show that in those two numbers at the bottom. And, and I will show you in the next slide where we show that, but we did not show that in the two numbers at the bottom because those were one-year contracts hired to deal with the pandemic and the differences in, in instruction this year, and they will go away um, in 21-22. So here, here you can, uh, oh, excuse me, that's the next slide. This slide is the non-certified, much simpler. And again, the RLA staff was supplied with existing staff from the district for that. And then if you go to the next screen. So here you'll see that 24.175 on the, on the bottom uh, right, that it ties back to that, um, those one-year contracts. But essentially, when you add the certified addition and the, and the uh, non-certified change, we have a 0 0.15 uh, increase in FTE across the district proposed for 21-22. So to review, this is the budget, the full pie chart with all the pieces put together. And then an overview slide again of where the salary increases are by those same levels. Um, 
and again adding up to that 5.32 percent increase with the biggest changes um, taking out here on this one the yellow highlights that up that showed on operations and maintenance and transportation but again that same slide that was shown earlier in the in the presentation so going forward our brown bag presentation is virtual this year um, so the brown bags themselves real or virtual will be uh, that's Thursday at 1230 um, and then next Tuesday night we start with our uh, first special meeting that is a virtual meeting as well the following Tuesday at 730 special budget meeting as well virtual and then um, we're back together Thursday for a regular business meeting in this room um, on Thursday at uh, the 28th um, as a regular meeting and then part of that meeting um, the agenda having the board meeting uh, excuse me the budget approved by the board and then finally uh, the following day the budget is moved to the town hall um, and then we will go forward with our, our work uh, communication with the board of finance board of selectmen and the RTM the budget completes on May 3rd hopefully all completes on May 3rd 2021 for the RTM vote we have also in the PowerPoint uh, we won't go through this tonight but if Sandy you can go next please we have a series of the historical slides we took those out of the presentation tonight but things like the budget increases past uh, and projected as well as some of the uh, enrollments and all those things are here they're also in your budget book but uh, as this is dispersed to the general public it'll be available for everybody so that concludes the budget presentation Thank you, Mr. Clemmings. Does the board have any high level questions just about the budget presentation that was given tonight? Ms. Rotelli. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I love seeing the inclusion of the Early um, Literacy Academy. It's long overdue, it's desperately needed. And the long term savings to the district can be great. So I just wanted to thank you and Mr. Mancusi for putting this together. Any other questions or comments? So is the takeaway talking point for tonight that 1.39 fills the hole? Yes. Um, I invite the board to just share any other um, suggestions for talking points. We talked about this a little bit in finance committee meeting um, just in terms of we understand the history of last year about how this year's budget was funded from the non-lapsing account um, the budget cuts that were made last year a hole was created the board of finance helped fill that hole by creating the non-lapsing account this year you know that hole is now going to be filled by our operating budget hopefully so thank you um, for the presentation and um, look forward to diving in next week Ms. Jacobson. <laughs> um, not on the presentation, but thank you for that. But just um, to the chair, to Mr. Cummings, um, we have to operate pretty quickly with questions for next week. So are we going to be having that document up at some point where we can submit the questions? Yes, I, I sent it out to everybody, but it, was it wasn't too long before the board meeting. So I'd ask you that you can make sure you can log into it. If you have any problems, let me know, and then we'll fix it. But it should be all set to go. Ms. Clark updated the pages this year, but it's very similar to last year's approach. And is there a particular date that you would like everyone to try to have their questions in by so staff has time to get answers <laughs> um, out before the meeting? We have, we're gonna work on, uh, we have time set aside on Tuesday. So I know it's a three day weekend, but if questions could be in by um, at, at the latest Monday evening, um, you know, we've set Tuesday aside to work on questions and responses. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Max Canelli. And how soon will you get us the breakdown of the agenda in terms of wh where is our focus for Tuesday and then where is our focus for the subsequent Tuesday? I think we have that. Um, Ms. Munsell, do you have that? We're getting the budget book right now. Do you have the page number? 
Yep, there it is. So for next Tuesday, it's the targeted enhancement and drivers, uh, it, the instructional services, supplies, text materials, other purchase services, tuition, contracted services, and capital. I am on the uh, third page in. It says at the top calendar. And then go down to um, 119. What, Ms. Vitale, just a suggestion, because I know in reading the budget book, there's the, the macro picture, and then how you dive down. Could this be accompanied by page numbers? Which you probably didn't have when you were putting the calendar together. But just to focus our questions, you know, so, oh, that, so like, for example, you'll say services here, instructional services, but there's the big picture, and then yep. all of the pages broken out throughout. So. If we, we could have that. the page numbers just so, I mean, even as many times as I've done this, yep. it would help. Yeah, we can do that. We can send that to the board. And also, just a disclaimer, I know that everybody approaches the budget a little bit differently in how they read the book. Um, Ms. Munsell, I may just be submitting questions to um, topics that aren't for next Tuesday. Is that okay? In terms of the spreadsheet, we can populate the we can populate the Google the Google Doc with any questions that we have right now. Yeah, go crazy if you if you uh, well not crazy, but if you if if like you have more time this week to go through the budget, then then yes, that'd be fine. And the, and the and the under yeah the the sheet is there for for questions and it's broken out on tabs by the sections of the book. But and we understand though that in terms of answering the question, the focus is going to be right. on those topics that are outlined. That's correct. I already picture Ms. Jacobson's uh, list of questions that we'll probably be seeing at you know quarter to six tomorrow morning. <laughs> As are we. <laughs> All right. Um, seeing no other questions about the budget, we will move on to adoption of policy 5131.6 substance abuse. That the Board of Education adopt policy 5131.6 substance abuse. Can I have a motion? Ms. Maxson-Canelli, seconded by Mr. Asa. Uh, Mrs. Maxson-Canelli, any comments? Um, just briefly, so this was uh, on a first read at our last meeting. Um, based on some questions here at the board table, we did take it back in policy, and as you'll see, we did make a, few, a couple of changes. First up in that first paragraph, and then in the first paragraph in red, the elimination of the word controlled. Um, just trying to be a little bit more precise to, precise and yet, by being precise, we want it to be more vague. Um, there are going to be, there are currently administrative regs on the website now. Those are being modified. And um, Mr. Cummings will be getting, I asked if he could please deliver those to the board um, just explicitly so that we could see those. Um, and and not necessarily whether in a Friday packet or whatever, it's not for discussion, but just so that the board can see precisely how this policy actually gets um, implemented. And in fact, some of the changes as well um, which are kind of in conjunction with the discussion we had at last week's special meeting. And I didn't receive any questions, so I'd, or I did get one, Mr. Peterson, sorry. But uh, so if anybody else has any, I'd be happy to address. Any other questions for the policy committee? Seeing none, um, thank you for just um, taking some of my questions and concerns back to the committee and making those changes. I think that, um, you captured, you addressed my concerns and I appreciate the work that you did on that. So seeing no other questions or comments, we'll take to the board for a vote. All in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Moving on, that the Board of Education adopt policy 6114.6 slash C dash 19.11 school closing for emergency conditions. Mrs. Maxson Canelli, seconded by Mr. Asa. Mrs. Maxson Canelli, the floor is yours. Okay, so just a few things. Um, so, first, as um, you were cautioned at last week's special meeting, that we are asking for a one and done on this. 
um, that, that this be both the first read and the vote for tonight for what I hope are obvious reasons um, in terms of the timeliness of it. A reminder that this is a C-19 policy, meaning there is going to be no vote required. This automatically expires as of June 30th. Now, whether this becomes something we talk about for subsequent years of this notion, um, that's going to be something that I'm sure will involve a very robust discussion if it's even suggested by our superintendent that we have such a discussion. Um, but in terms of this has now gone two rounds in the policy committee. Um, lengthy discussion um, in terms of the concerns of, of the policy committee uh, to, towards having this policy. Um, some of the things, and, and it was a very, very productive conversation uh, with Mr. Cummings in terms of our concerns of how something like this would be implemented. You know, first obviously looking for, not obviously, but first looking for the assurances and the understanding that this is not something that's we're interested in in cases of any question of power. You know, that the equity issue of all students being able to even access the education. Um, I should back up and say, never mind the hooray at the snow day notion, which we did not want lost and we were all for, and I should add our superintendent was lockstep with us on that one. Um, you know, discussion regarding the value of a remote day in December versus a day in June. And we as a policy committee did not accept that a June day would be of a lesser academic value. Um, and so, because that would be the trade-off here. You cancel a day and not implement this policy, it means adding a day in June, and we had discussion about that. So there were, a several, as I said, uh, the discussion went at length. Um, we were ultimately comfortable bringing this forward um, and believe that we were heard by Mr. Cummings regarding our concerns of this being invoked, um, but it is ultimately here before the board. I don't know if uh, Mrs. Jacobson or uh, Mrs. Guernsey wants to add anything regarding some of the concerns we had. Um, again, it was probably well over an hour's worth of discussion between the two meetings. Ms. Jacobson? Sure, hi, um, Jen Jacobson. Um, I think Mrs. Max and Kennelly captured the accent, uh, essence quite well. I would add just a couple of different topics that were also discussed was um, not only the equity and the power, but equity and fidelity to the instructional day. So whether that be district-wide, by level and between our schools, so that there isn't a discrepancy happening in buildings in terms of the hours that our kids are getting um, on such a day, and that the schedule does follow what's expected by the state in terms of instructional time on those days. So just a couple additional points of what we expressed um, in policy, and you know, I think some of that is reflected in the regs here. Um, so you know, a charge to Mr. Cummings to ensure that that, that, that happens. Ms. Guernsey, do you have anything to add? Okay, Ms. Pitko? I just have a quick question um, in terms of like internet. I, I just thinking of the last couple of days and we're having internet issues, you know, specifically to the students that were in school. Is, is there something in mind of, I understand if the kids are home and there's no internet, then technically you can't say it, you have to call it a snow day. But the kids at home had internet. It was the kids that were in school. I'm wondering if there's something in place of, you know, there's no electricity or something in this that you have to send them home. Is that now? I, I don't know how to word this. I'm just wondering, like, are you going to address this in your superintendent's report? Because it seemed to be a very big concern to people in the last couple of days. And I only think of it because I didn't have any internet. And I had to call my boss and say, uh, I can't teach remotely today because I have no internet. Right. Yeah, we, we do, are, do have an update. Dr. Parrish has, uh, has been working on this, and uh, Ms. Burns will be available by phone during the superintendent's report. Mr. Issa. Just really quick um, to Mr. Cummings. Um, I'm, I'm guessing this was obviously covered, but are, are there any contractual implications here? And you know, was, was any staff involved, um, any, anything to that point? We had conversations primarily with the teacher's bargaining unit around this, um, but there is an expectation, and it's one, one of the regulations that we've re reviewed with everybody, that essentially it is a work day. Um, and if somebody, for whatever reason, can't work, um, they, they're gonna have to go through the regular avenues to take that day off. Um, and, uh, could you just, um, since we're on this topic, um, just touch on um, 
your general criteria for calling a snow day versus a remote day? So there's no scientific way to do this. I think, I think first of all, one of the criteria would be kind of um, how it may impact the, the end of the year calendar. So being mindful of kind of, you know, that last week of June or even trying not to get to that and trying to avoid the hot weather of June um, doesn't give us a lot of wee leeway for actually calling snow days. Um, but that's kind of, that's certainly something in our mind that, you know, we, we only can go so far with snow days and, and, and try and, and, uh, and not uh, impact April's break, for example. Um, that's one set of criteria. The other, uh, the other big criteria really would be, um, I think, the type of weather. When we looked at that, um, that snow that we had on, I think it was the 17th of December, to my mind, um, that set up as a good snow day because it was going to be snow. It was going to be a good amount of snow on the ground, and kids could go out and enjoy it. In fact, I, I share with the policy committee that I'm aware um, parents who are far better than me um, didn't even tell their kids that it was going to be a snow day. And they let them go through the whole thing, you know, the spoons, <laughs> flushing the toilet, all that stuff. And then they woke up and they had a snow day. So I, parents of the year, that's awesome. Um, um, I will tell you just parenthetically, as somebody who lives in a school district that had their kids do a remote learning day and has enough kids to help me clear the driveway, nobody was available for work. <laughs> and that was a heavy snow. Um, so we have to get together as districts. But, um, but to my mind, it was a good snow day, a day where you're going to get you know, a quarter of an inch of ice on the ground and that type of thing. I mean, that presents power issue concerns, but that, to my mind, is a good day. You might as well just be in school, uh, you know, remotely at home because it's not a day you can go out and enjoy. So those are kind of the two big set of criteria that I, I think we're going to look at. And the third, obviously, I'm sorry, I should say, the third uh, really being the concern about power. And, you know, Mr. Papajari and I spoke several times on Thursday and he was getting reassurances from the police and the town and, and then reassuring me that any power outages in town were sporadic and very small. So that set up Friday fairly well, but it's not always going to be like that. Okay, so thank you. And I, I just, I think it was more for the public that I just wanted to make sure that the public knows that by us approving this policy, it does not mean that you are going to just start doing away with snow days. And it sounds like you made it very clear here that you are a supporter of snow days when appropriate. And we can hopefully look forward to a couple of those here and there. Uh, I, I think it's a, you know, we should all love snow days. And I, if I'm hearing the policy committee correctly, also on those days where you're just like, oh, do we send them to school? Push to send them to school. I, I, I would add to that, you know, this, this, the, this last usage of it, December 18th, kind of came with two um, distinct twists that made it very um, appropriate for this. And one was the fact that Mr. Cummings was able to really warn staff ahead of time, this might be appropriate for Friday, which meant staff should have been ready for it. Um, but then secondly, there was an issue out of the control of the district of the town DPW and using up a certain number of hours and needing then basically not being available to have all of the schools and all of the parking lots cleared. Um, I hope I explained that in very vague terms accurately. So it was kind of a little bit of a a distinct issue. Hopefully that wouldn't happen again. Again, it w there's no question it was clearly stated we want the kids in the buildings. There's nothing about this that's meant to say, oh, this would be so easy to fall back on. That aspect of our, of our intent, I think, was loud and clear. Uh, uh, can I just add, I, I think that raises a good point. One of the things that we talked about in policy was, if you think back to last Monday, Monday, the day we came back from break, well, it did, turned out to be a non-event. There was some concern that he, that late that night of that there might be some snow. And, you know, I went to bed uh, thinking we might have a delay in the morning. So Angus and I were talking at 430, and it turned out to be, like I said, a non-event. It sounded like if the forecast had come true, that would, that would have been a morning for a delay. That wouldn't have been a morning to say, um, well, it's a delay. We might as well just stay home all day and do remote learning. So delays are still going to happen. Um, if, if the conditions call for it. If we feel we can get the kids in safely, the high school kids in, say, by 8.30, then we're going we're gonna to still do the delay. 
Excellent. And now we're not going to have to worry about with the cohort A and co cohort B with the elementary school, That's which right. was an issue in December. Yep. All right. That was my question just about a delayed opening. Um, just a reassurance that you will still be using that option as opposed to just saying, oh, we'll just call a remote learning day. All right. Thank you. C can I just seek my own yes. clarification? You said 830. Do we have a one-hour opening plan as well as a two-hour? No, I, I, I just did an hour and a half there. It should, I should have done two. Yeah, to 9 o'clock. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Hortelli. Uh, can you explain um, your thinking on potentially not or calling a snow day and adding a day in June just because hopefully as the weather gets warmer and the case numbers come down, we could have a higher probability of having all kids back in school by June and maybe more beneficial to have that full school day at the end of the year for all kids in school instead of remote and just your feelings yeah. on that absolutely i what i'm trying to avoid is um backing up into the, i i think our i apologize because i don't remember this right now but i think our, our concern is that last week of june and trying to keep kids out of school just because of heat issues in the building particularly those a building like uh, Fairfield Ludlow or any school with a second story on it um, that isn't doesn't have necessary air conditioning throughout. So we would try to avoid going that deep into June. So it's really trying to balance, you know, that we don't have that bad of a winter, that we, we don't get pushed into that. Uh, because the alternative is that if we get pushed against that last week, we're going to start coming back out of April break. And which are really, you know, so many people go away those days you, school could be open, but you're going to have staffing issues. You're going to have attendance concerns. So it's it's really I don't know, Ms. Ritelli, if I'm explaining this right, but it's really trying to balance kind of going forward. And, and sometimes you're, you're essentially making a bet, um, a bet easier to make, say, in late March than it is right now. Do, do you know what I mean? Okay. Any other questions or comments before we vote? Okay. Seeing none. All in favor? Ms. Dick. Uh, Ms. Motion carries, 9 0, it is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, moving on to new business approval of special education trainers collective bargaining agreement. Recommend a motion that the Board of Education approve the collective bargaining agreement between the Fairfield Board of Education and the special education trainers for the period July 1st, 2019, June 30th, 2022. We have a motion, Ms. Pico, seconded by Mrs. Gerber. All in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Thank you all. Um, and just for the public's clarification, Ms. Leeper represented the board on this um, collective bargaining. She is no longer on the board, so she could not um, voice her support publicly, but she did provide guidance um, for the board to move forward with this. So I thank her for her service and her work on this. Moving forward, approval of the, uh, I'm sorry. First reading of revised capital projects non-recurring project for 2021-2022. Mr. Papa George. Good evening, everyone. Angelus Papa George, Executive Director of Maintenance and Facilities. So what you have before you is the uh, Fairfield Public Schools proposed capital and non-reoccurring projects. You've seen this book already. It's just been updated because we removed the uh, relocation of Walter Fitzgerald from its current location to the hopefully soon new location. And we've added the uh, Fairfield Ledlow High School building automated system upgrade. So that was the only change made to this building since uh, this book since the last time you guys approved it in late October. Um, just briefly, the project that we are proposing at this point is quite a bit higher than the original proposed project. It would become a capital project, not a non-reoccurring project. Uh, we did work with uh, the CFO from the town, and he does believe it will fit within the town's portfolio to be able to perform this project this year. Um, this is a upgrade to the automated building system. So what that means is our HVAC systems it's a computerized system that we went through 
uh, we're actually finishing a couple of the schools up. We went ahead and we replaced the front end computer system on these uh, built in some of our buildings because they identified our IT department identified some safety concerns with opening up portals when our I when our HVAC technicians were logging in from outside. So we had to update to a newer system. So what that consisted of is taking the front end system and updating the computers to it and putting a temporary fix in there that would bridge the old version system to the newer system. What this proposal is is to go back and now remove all the uh, what they call the back end equipment where it ties and integrates directly to the HVAC systems and uh, allow us to upgrade it. Uh, by doing so, we should have better control over the buildings, better energy management over the buildings, and also included in this project is a contingency to tie in some of the points and systems that are currently not under our control and are using an old-fashioned type light switch to turn on and off exhaust fans, for instance, and bathrooms and that type of setup. So that's the big change, if you have any questions about the proposed project. Mr. Asa. It just out of curiosity, I know you mentioned uh, working with the town. Um, is, is that on the town side, are they looking to do any of this type of work and are we piggybacking with them to try and take advantage of cost savings? They, I do know that they are putting out an RFP for energy management, but um, their, their systems are a bit different than ours and they're a bit behind what our systems are. And we're <laughs> trying to move forwards with this and one of the reasons we chose Ledlow as the first building is because we're continuously having failures in there where we've had fans running and they're not under control. So we want to get a better understanding, a better control over the actual building. And we don't feel holding off on doing that would be beneficial. Okay, and, and how many of our schools, just out of curiosity, need updates to systems like this that are this um, complicated or complex? Um, as far as project-wise and cost-wise, the obviously the larger schools are the larger cost. Our intentions are to try control first and then uh, move on to the element, the middle schools. And the elementary schools may even be able to be done under an operating budget as opposed to a capital or a non-reoccurring budget because of the size of the building. And we also have quite a few buildings such as Holland Hill, Mill Hill will be that have already been converted during the construction projects. Okay, so Riverfield, Mill Hill, and Holland Hill are up to date. Up to date, correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, moving on to first reading of the project's waterfall. So you have a couple pieces in front of you. There's three all together. The first one is kind of a PowerPoint that we put together. It just quickly overviews the, um, uh, let's see, waterfall, the drivers for the waterfall as to what, what the intent was with the updated waterfall. So we continued to meet the goals of the former initiatives, begin work on newly identified initiatives, and update project pricing for, the, for all projects within the waterfall. Um, also in here, we listed some of the former initiatives, which I say former, but we are still working towards some of them. And then also the third page is our new waterfall initiatives, which I believe are the new focus of what the district should be looking at, what we should be moving forwards for. And there's some basic infrastructure, HVAC systems, indoor air quality, which would be that ABA, the automated building systems that we're talking about for this year. Uh, improved building management would also fall under that management system. And then uh, some boilers, elevators, you'll see in there is infrastructure equipment that should be on the waterfall that we've added to the waterfall for the years. And then the last page is just some assumptions that are made with this current waterfall. That's uh, just some points that we had on here. Uh, you'll see, if you're familiar with the existing waterfall chart that we have, the color-coded chart, and then we have, I think the most valuable part is this last page, which is the um, 
kind of the summary of everything, which begins on actually page two. I apologize. It begins on page one. Are you on the color coded or the black and white? The black and white one, which is the, it's kind of a summary of the color coded sheets there. Um, normally at this point, I would just kind of go through the, everything that's been a changed in there. The green and reds indicate movement or increase or decrease in pricing for projects. Um, normally I'd go line by line, but if you Look at the first page, there's only a couple, but once you start getting to the second and third page, you'll see there's quite a few changes in there. So if you'd like, I can go line by line or I can allow you guys to review on your own and get back with any questions. Or if you have questions now, I'd be happy to take them. Mr. Asa? I would just say, I mean, I, I'm going to need some time to digest and look through this, but could you hit maybe some of the big highlights at least, um, like some major ones that kind of jump off the page uh sure one of the i think one of the biggest ones to look at and i think it will be very clear as soon as people get to and i apologize i have to look ahead to look at the year it was in in uh In the year 24-25, we identify the uh, Dwight renovation and addition project. And uh, it's got a uh, almost a, it's just over a $10 million increase from what it originally sat on the waterfall chart as. So it went from 20 to just over $30 million as a renovation project. Uh, that being because we actually toured and went through the building with the owner's rep and a contractor and we looked fully at what was needed for the building, what the big challenges were for that particular building, and we wanted to make sure we were doing an all-inclusive project at that site. Uh, some of the other big changes you'll see is we've added the roof schedule to the waterfall chart, so you'll see those on there throughout the years now as opposed to just seeing them as they're appearing as they are needed. Um, another big change I think is worth noting is uh, for our underground oil tanks. In the past, it has said uh, replace underground oil tanks. Um, w at this point, we're looking at removing and not replacing the underground oil tanks. The reason being is there used to be many years ago, there was a state mandate that said we needed a backup supplemental heating. So we had dual burners in our boilers. We have gas, natural gas, and then a backup oil system. Uh, that mandate has gone away. Also, we used to get special pricing from the gas suppliers because we had the ability to switch to a, a oil burner as opposed to a gas during a high peak. So, and that initiative has gone away as well. So at this point, we're, we're looking to remove those so we can get better, as we replace boilers, we can get better efficiency boilers in our buildings, more better efficient, more energy savings within the boilers. Um, and we're also eliminating at five of our sites the underground oil tanks, which are a liability at this point because they have to be maintained, they have to be tested, they have to be serviced, and they have to be replaced. They have a life expectancy of 20 to 30 years, and then they have to be pulled out and replaced. So we're looking at the end of the life expectancy on these uh, underground tanks, and we're looking to remove and not replace. So is that is that line 70 and 71, or is it is it in other places? Correct, it's the line 70 and 71 there where it says, uh, oh wait, I just lost it, I'm sorry. Underground oil tank removal. And and can you just, sorry, the, we have 500,000, but then we have a decrease? Yes, because obviously- we're taking them out and We're not taking them out them. and not replacing them, so we're s seeing an energy savings there. We're also seeing a savings because when we worked with uh, some underground tank companies, because we do have old stagnant oil in them, there's a savings there because they're willing to buy the oil as part of the project. Have, have we run into, with any of these projects in the past, have we run into any contamination that could potentially throw this number through the roof? Or I, I cannot speak to past removal and replacement projects. I can look into that. I can tell you that we do have monitors that have de leak detection systems on these tanks. They're dual. They're dual-walled tanks, so if they have a leak, de they have a leak detection system. So if, 
if the outer wall is detecting a liquid inside of it, it sets off an alarm and we investigate. We're currently investigating one now. So they believe it's just rainwater has gotten between the walls, but that's something we do do on a regular basis. We get false alarms like that and we have to go out and investigate. And they do cost money to do because we have to pump, have a specialty company come out and pump that water out from underneath inside the two layers and then we can go in and investigate. When, when you do that, do you have to dig up around the tank to get access? Not unless it expands to that. Normally it's a matter of removing the liquid that's in there and then they can send cameras down to do inspections. Okay. Ms. Jacobson. Um, just two quick things for tonight. Um, number one, thank you for putting boilers back on our waterfall. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of became a little slightly obsessed with boilers a couple of years ago, um, and it did become an issue sometimes when it not they weren't on here because they can become an unexpected, unbudgeted item for us. Um, so thank you for that. And then in th this second question is, um, I notice a lot of the new vegetable projects vestibule is that how you say it? um is that not something that we should discuss here but i'm just is that a security upgrade or, or some or just what is that uh yeah i, I don't know how comfortable we feel. okay no problem got it mrs gruber followed by Ms. ticker um thanks very much for uh for all of this uh, work i'm sure it was incredibly time consuming um i was excited to see very far into i'm looking at the black and white um document right now with the uh, the red and green colored numbers on it um, to see uh, new uh, it's down the road a bit but new air conditioning for Ludlow and Ward High School is in here and um, and that's that's really exciting even though it's far away it's nice to see that it's actually in writing somewhere um, I guess my question is though uh, with the assumption that uh, Dwight and Jennings would have air conditioning built into their renovation projects. Um, I feel like now we're down to, and then there were three who still don't have air conditioning in writing here as a possibility, and that would be Osborne Hill, North Stratfield, and Woods, I believe, are the only, would be the last three remaining non-air conditioned schools. And I was just curious, is there any thought to try to work them in a little bit earlier or do we really think that we're looking past I mean it's kind of scary some of these numbers 20 32 33 is the last one on here and I just hate the thought of those three schools still like waiting <laughs> for air conditioning so I just didn't know if there's any thought of trying to and I realize this is a, a dynamic living document that is constantly changing but just wanted to put my two cents in for the the three remaining schools just Sherman's done yeah they had theirs and um, Sherman is complete yeah so what what you see there are the two largest projects with the two largest price tags on them would be the two high schools um, moving forwards as you guys know we've put out for an RFP for a consultant to come in and assist with pricing and best practices to air conditioning the remaining buildings within the district our goal was to put the largest price tags on there so that as placeholders and then to get the more information from our consultants once they're hired. Um, and the really the belief was with some of these smaller buildings, as you mentioned, the elementary schools, some of them are a quarter, three quarters split unit air conditioned already. So there may not be such a large price tag to add air conditioning to the remainder parts of the building. So we, we wanted to get better pricing on that first and we w really wanted to take a deep look at it because it could even be a project that we could handle over three years in a operating price as opposed to putting it as a project. So we, we really wanted to get a better handle on what those costs would be and what the best way to handle the doing those and that's why the use of the consultant. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just feel like, I mean, obviously I think everyone on this board and probably anyone who has children in the school system is well aware of how important air conditioning is. And I think since COVID has come to town, we've become even more sensitive to air circulation, to mechanical means of fresh air. So it's just something I know a lot of people are thinking about. And I just thought it'd be helpful to get it out there that even though these schools aren't on here, that it's still, we're, we're looking for ways to get everybody better air circulation as quickly as we can and as 
Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons we jumped on the opportunity to add the project for Ledlow High School for the automated building systems when we had that opportunity come up. Great, thank you. Ms. Pickup? I must have to think of my question again now that you went down that road. Um, I, I know these numbers are as of today. I'm looking at the total cost of Jennings projected to be 32 million? Approximately, is that? Correct, we okay. worked with uh, an owner's rep and an uh, escalator and the prices are as of today for Dwight and for Jennings, but Jennings was escalated out as well. So we use a 3% escalator through for all projects moving forwards from this year. Mrs. Masconelli. Just to follow up on that, in other words, these are not the prices that it would be if we did it this year. That 3% has already been included. Correct. As a rough estimate. Um, I, I, I'm sure, I think Mr. Reese already said this, I'm, I'm definitely gonna need to digest this and, and look this over. But because this was a little overwhelming to see, I'm, I apologize if you said this when you first gave it to us, but what exactly was the reason for the bumping of Dwight and Jennings? Because those are significant price tags that are gonna come up at some point. Mill Hill will have been completed. So what was the rationale for bumping them specific? I, obviously I know that if you bumped one, you then had to bump the other, but why in the first place? Uh, well, actually, actually taking a step back, if you remember Jennings was actually prior to Dwight. So the first bump we made was we swapped Dwight and Jennings. And the reason for doing that was because of the air quality issues that have come up over the years at Dwight and the concerns of some continuous air quality issues within the building. So we wanted to be able to address that before addressing Jennings. The uh, second bump out reasoning was that we wanted to have the time to do a full evaluation and understanding of the Dwight building, the Dwight project, and see what the best approach would be to take on the Dwight site. And so if Dwight needs that much more time Jennings couldn't have been done in the meantime? Uh, actually at the board, at the finance committee meeting, we did discuss possibly swapping Jennings and Dwight back to give more time. So it's something we can look at. Okay, um, and then I also was unclear because I, I, I know to expect certain price tags because we've been adding to the buildings. But as far as I know, there hasn't been discussion of our adding to Dwight and Jennings. So I was wondering just roughly the explanation of the significant price tag with them again. Uh, so the significant price tag with uh, Dwight is again due to the air quality issues. When we looked at the building, we realized that there's almost a complete overhaul needed. At, at most of our buildings, when we do a renovation and addition, a lot of the internal classrooms that are already there will get some new millwork, some paint, some reconfiguring, new drop ceilings, that type of equipment new lighting so up at Dwight we when we started really digging in and looking at Dwight we've identified that there's some issues within the infrastructure that should be addressed during a renovation project uh, we identified almost every classroom at Dwight would need some significant work done to it to bring it up so it, it was almost like walking Dwight was like peeling an onion every time we went into another room there was another layer that we looked at and realized that there was more that needed to be done at that school and that, that, again, is a small addition, but not significant. That's a, most of what you're looking at there is a behind the walls price tag. So at the end of the day, you'll see some paint and updates, but a lot of that is behind the walls that you won't even see when we're done. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the uh, air qualities that we've, with the vents, we've done some, a lot, of, I should say, a lot of Band-Aid work up there with trying to improve the air quality with the vent pipes. We've opened up some walls, replaced vent pipes within the walls, and uh, we just continue to have chase down issues and put Band-Aids on them at this point. And so I recognize that this is very early and so that this is, I'm not trying to be alarmist at all, but are you, worst case scenario, are we talking a teardown? You don't like that question. I, I would answer that. I think that that's a possibility at Dwight. Okay, thank you. Mr. Asa. 
you hit the nail on the head there that I was going to say. I think looking at these numbers um, makes me even more and more excited to get over with COVID and get this done with so we can get the kids back to school and move on to the work that we started um, prior to this pandemic, which included, um, you know, facility utilization, um, facility planning. Um, and I think looking at $60 million of two schools, I think this board and future boards are going to have to do some serious digging and a lot of rolling up the sleeves and work to see what the true return on investment, um, not only financial, but educationally, um, what is the best move for this district um, with regard to these schools and these projects. So I, I would put it out there now that what Mrs. Maxim Canelli said, based on what you're talking about, um, y you sometimes get to a point where I is it worth fixing um, or is it worth looking at a bigger picture, looking at our district, looking at placement of our schools and having a broader discussion, which I think we're going to have. And um, I, I look forward to that. Absolutely. As I said, we are very preliminary, but we are teetering on that line at this point. Mr. Puppetras, do you have a rough estimate what it would cost to build a school similar size to Dwight? Is that the 30 million? Is that uh, a new con basically a new construction for a school? That that price tag is probably fairly accurate to a new building construction. I would say though, that just as a cautionary statement, to, to go back to Mr. Ace's comment, for a school of that size, if we were to correct, if we were to get engaged in a larger discussion around property, it, that cost could go up if we decided to re rebuild that school at a different size or a different capacity. Yeah, and if I could just follow up on that, that that's what I was getting at. Um, you know, we, we may have to look at the bigger picture on, you know, I'm not talking about closing schools and all that stuff right now, but I'm I am putting it out there that that is going to have to be a topic that we discuss. And, and Dwight is a, is a large piece of property, um, and I think there's a lot of potential there. So we could look at what is best for our district, um, you know, at, at elementary, other level. We, it's just, it's a big discussion we're going to have to have. Absolutely, I welcome that. And the Finance Committee, not this current Finance Committee, met with the Strategic Planning Committee a year or two years ago, it almost seems like at this point. Um, and there was really some questions that they raised to, to the Board of Ed in terms of putting millions and millions of dollars into aging buildings and adding on but not necessarily addressing the infrastructure. So, you know, as a, a Dwight parent, <laughs> a former Dwight parent, I understand the needs there. Um, I would have concerns about putting money into that building unless you were addressing what's behind the walls and the infrastructure there as well. So I appreciate that um, we're really taking an honest look at that building, even though it's coming with a higher price tag, um, and look forward to, as Mr. Ace has said, having a discussion about you know, what the what other possibilities are, are there. Um, and looking at the district as a whole, this board was having that discussion back to almost a year ago, um, and I look forward to beginning it again. And a lot of this work will be done at the Finance Committee, and with that I'm going to give it to our ch the, the new chair of the Finance Committee for a question or a comment. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad Mr. Asa and Mrs. Canelli brought up the issue of, of the Jennings-Dwight uh, swap, because we did discuss that extensively in uh, in finance committee the one thing that occurs to me uh, that uh, we discussed a lot about and this board has dealt with uh, issues of indoor air quality at Dwight for for years we've we've been up there we've smelled some smells um, has the same level of attention been done for Jennings and Jennings is a building of similar vintage uh, I, I know you said you walked through with the team in, in Dwight and, and did a checklist did you also do a similar checklist at Jennings to warrant this this swap we did do the similar walkthrough at Jennings we don't have what we feel is as many concerns within that building there's no I don't want to say immediate but more pressing issues in that particular building I know vintage wise they're similar I think structural wise they're and infrastructure wise I should say they're in better they're not really comparable there was a different build out as opposed to Dwight and Mill Hill I'm sorry Dwight and Jennings uh, I think one of the biggest pushes for Jennings was that w to remove the portable classroom, which would eliminate portable classrooms within the district. 
Mr. Oso. Just one last final question. Um, with regard to us going back and presenting this information to the Board of Finance in February, correct? Correct. Um, are we, I mean, obviously you've given us numbers here tonight, so am I to assume that the majority of the work that you were doing, that you had told the Board of Finance that you were doing to get more accurate numbers and get everything in line, is this gonna come back to us before going to the Board of Finance? again or are we what what's the next step i believe it's i don't believe the waterfall chart is voted on but i believe the capital projects and non-recurring projects will be voted on this is what will be presented to the board of finance okay so you you feel comfortable that you are prepared to to we're, we're ahead of the schedule then correct we are we are prepared to present to the board of finance this should be on the uh, meeting agenda on the 28th again Any other questions? Ms. Guernsey. Hi, um, just a quick one, and it's uh, related to the indoor air quality, which I'm just delighted to see um, is Highway Bureau's new initiative and really is um, obviously, as Mrs. Gerber mentioned earlier, uh, something that's come to the forefront through all of the COVID um, situation. And I'm just wondering in terms of the HVAC report that you've been working on, um, and if this is all interrelated, so I hope this is appropriate time to ask, is it possible because of the timing, and I'm feeling this sense of immediacy, right? Is it possible that um, that report could be submitted in stages, like by building or something, so that we could um, obtain that information more quickly um, and have those estimates as the progress progresses instead of waiting until, I, I don't remember what the date was. So I think you're thinking of two different reports. The, w the AC study report was a, something we put out for RFP for an engineer and contractors to come in and give us the best practice and the best way to add air conditioning within the buildings. I think what you're referring to is the recommissioning of the buildings, which is in here as a non-recurring project that we hope to move forward with. That would give us our rebalancing and our redistribution of air so we know the full extent of what air exchanges are happening in the buildings and how air is moving within the buildings to make sure we are still meeting what's required by code or above and gives us the controls over making some adjustments as needed. If I'm incorrect, please tell me. No, actually, but I'm just, I'm kind of, in my mind, they're so interrelated. I'm just thinking about the timing and how we can receive this information more quickly. Um, you know, as we're reopening schools, this is, this is a critical point of consideration, obviously. Agreed. So the RFP portion, that one is still out. It, uh, I shouldn't say still out. It's with the town purchasing department. They're reviewing their, we, we review the uh, submittals. They're now reviewing the submittals and then we'll meet with the top uh, candidates to discuss scope of work and choose a candidate out of that one. So that's for the RFP portion of the air conditioning. The, um, the school re retro commissioning, unfortunately still has not started yet because it has to go before the bodies and get approval for the funding for it. It's scheduled for the February 1st for the Board of Selectmen and then it will move on to the Board of Finance and the RTM. Once, it's a, once the, the budgeting is approved, then we would get it out for an RFP as quickly as possible and then provide, pick, the, uh, pick, and, uh, pick the top candidates for it and then get it moving as quickly as possible. We are trying to move it quickly. Um, we, were, we had originally thought about asking for a bid waiver on it so that once the funding was av available, we wouldn't have to put it out the bid. Uh, we, we can still do that. I don't know with the new regulations by the Board of Finance if they're going to accept that because of the price tag on it. Um, thanks so much. That's helpful. Mrs. Massa Canelli. Uh, just one quick question to Mr. Vitale or to Mr. Cummings. Um, the, the drafts of this, the black and white, the one that says 111 and one says 112, what's d what is, I was trying to quickly eyeball and, and I don't know what I missed, but I have two drafts on my table. I assume I should throw out the January 11th one. Mr. Carpenter, can you speak to that? Do you know? I'm, I'm not sure which one. I don't know why you have two. <laughs> Ms. Mexican, you said you're the black and white one the, with the red and green, I guess, had. 
Yeah, I, I'll see you afterwards. I think you may have just gotten something stuck together with another one. Mr. Papatros, do you have an idea of when um, you're going to pick a contractor for the HVAC study? Because I think to Ms. Guernsey's question, that just finding out what our needs are will help us give pet better pricing. Um, and as you know, we're quite anxious to just get that information. Um, so any idea of a timeline of when a contractor might be chosen? My original timeline had us already choosing one. I know, as I, s as I mentioned, we've, we've gone through the uh, submittals. We've done our, s the myself and Mr. Morbido sat down and went through the submittals. We did our independent scorecards on the mm -hmm. contractors and we've turned it back over to purchasing department and they were gonna do the same and then we were gonna compare notes and move forward. Um, I would have to follow up with the purchasing department to see where they are at this point. I know they've had it for a f since just before the holiday, so I would hope they're getting close at this point. Yeah. Hand? Okay, thank you for that clarification. And just in terms of that study, um, we've our schools have air conditioning, as you said, split level. Is that different though? You know, even if a school has air conditioning, could we also have concerns about mechanical means of fresh air in some buildings? Uh, Are they two, two separate issues? Should we just not be assuming that that school, that school's fully air conditioned so their, the HVAC is fine in that building? That's actually correct. They are, in some buildings, they are two separate. For instance, Holland Hill just finished a renovation, but it has a DOAS system, which is a dedicated outdoor air system. And then it's got cooling in the classrooms, but the cooling is, to simplify it, it's more like your air conditioner unit. It's bringing, piping in the coolant needed to cool the and recirculate the air within that classroom. So it's not bringing, it's not ducted to the outside and bringing in fresh air. It's recirculating the air within the classroom. It's filtering it and recirculating it. But then an incorporated into that specific classroom as well is an outdoor air system. So we do have fresh air coming in and then it's getting pulled into a, s a cooling system and circulating through the room. But it's, they can be two different systems. You take a school like Roger Ledlow Middle School where it has rooftop air conditioner units where it's bringing fresh air in, combining with return air from the building, combining that air and recirculating it through. So there are two different types of systems and depending on what building you're specifically talking about would determine what type of system we have. And I think, you know, need to make that clarification for the public because many times we talk about air conditioning and it seems like it's a luxury and this mechanical means of fresh air is equally and in some cases maybe more important to be looking at in our buildings. Um, Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head where to find it on the website, but way back when we were opening buildings in September, we put out a, uh, a list of buildings and the type of air systems it had, whether it had a DOAS system or whether it had a rooftop system. So we broke out what type of building, each building and what type of fresh air system it was utilizing within the building. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for, um, for all this information um, and it will be on our regular meeting agenda at the end of the month. If anybody please has any questions to Mr. Papa George, I know it's a lot of information, just send them along um, so we can hopefully get some questions answered before that meeting or of course he'll be available at the end of the month to answer questions then. Thank you. Ms. Aitake, I just have a question to the board. Um, anticipating a number of questions around the waterfall and not trying to give the board members too many Google Docs to interact with, but would it be helpful given the amount of information on these charts that um, we even just did a document that people could line questions up, say, by years so that there wasn't necessarily overlap and, and it would be easier to find questions? I think that's a great idea. Okay. All right, we'll work on that and get that out. Yeah, I imagine we might have, some of us might have the same questions just to yeah, so you can streamline. Build it. on them or not repeat. Yep, okay. Thank you. Okay, approval of minutes. So the Board of Education approved the minutes from October 29th, 2020, special meeting, December 8th, 2020, regular meeting. Mrs. Gerber, seconded by Ms. Jacobson. Um, any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll take this board for a vote. All in favor? 
Uh, Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Mrs. Gerber, Ms. Vitale, Mr. Asa, Ms. Maxwell-Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kernsey, all opposed? Abstentions? Um, Ms. Pitko? So motion carries 8-0-1. Superintendent's report. Okay, a couple things to um, talk about tonight. Um, first, I just want to give the board a, a kind of a heads up on a situation we're concerned about at Fairfield Woods. We're going to talk a little bit. Uh, I just want to give a brief follow up on the anti racism work based on the conversation last week, Wednesday with the Fairfield Equity Coalition. And then I'm going to have um, uh, Dr. Zavichan to give an update on the K 5 return. Um, to the 9-1 day starting on Tuesday. And um, Dr. Parrish can speak to the internet outages and how the district is um, responding to that over the last couple of days. So um, just I want to let board members and public know, we, we are watching a situation at Woods based on quarantine issues around staff. So, um, you know, we've dealt with this before the holidays. If the board remembers, we were concerned at one point um, with Roger Ludlow, and we were concerned with um, Tomlinson to some degree, um, but this this week it is Woods um, speaking with Ms. Bannock this morning. She had 16 staff absent. Um, some of those classrooms were covered, but 10 of those, uh, eight, I think, uh, I'm going to try to remember now, seven or eight of those folks were quarantine related um, with the possibility that at least two more would be quarantine related. Uh, I got a text from her earlier this evening that an additional staff member who was not on that list um, is now uh, in quarantine or is now a positive case, I should say. So um, we are monitoring the staffing situation at Woods. They are, um, as, as has been the case throughout the last few months, um, and enough can't be said about the responsiveness of our teachers and administrators to these situations. Um, teachers are taking up extra sections. Um, students are not being grouped together. St students are staying in their classrooms and are being substitute taught by teachers who are giving up their preps uh, and their team times to um, support the students. Um, administrators um, are substituting in classrooms as well. Uh, this isn't just happening at Woods this week. This has happened in all of our schools, particularly at the secondary level. Um, in the past couple months, but that's what's happening at Woods. But she and I agreed that we would talk again tomorrow in the afternoon um, because we are a little co bit concerned about staffing by the end of the week. We're not sure where this is going. And, and one of the things that she and, and Mr. Seltzer did is they counted out the staffing and we don't expect the staff who are in quarantine back until next week. Some of them at the beginning of next week, some of them at the end of next week. So additional staff, um, absences is going to is only going to work against us right now so i just want to make people aware that this is something that we're we're going to have to monitor and we may have to go in remote at woods for if we can't safely staff the building and, and keep conditions safe there um, again our criteria we talked about this with miss bannock today our criteria remains that um the building is safely uh able to operate so um that we're not creating conditions where students have to be grouped together and we have, you know, in, in, uh, in violate the mitigation protocols, which they are not doing. Um, we also are not in a situation where um, we don't have adequate coverage ratio wise from administrators or teachers to the number of students. So that if, you know, um, there was some uh, external threat to the building or there was a concern with a fire alarm or something like that we would be adequately prepared and be able to safely ensure the passage of students. Um, and then we just have to be mindful of um, the, if this, these types of things continue, the impact on staff. So those are just things we're gonna continue to monitor. And, I, and again, I just wanted to make the board aware and the public aware since we had the meeting tonight. I don't know if there's any questions on that. Ms. Gornsey followed by Mrs. Max Canelli. Um, so my question, um, it sounds like when you're talking about staff now, you're talking about um, primarily the teachers, but um, I have a question about, uh, I guess it, it would maybe be re more related to the general staff, like the cafeteria worker and the closure related to that. So is this an appropriate time for that question or should I hold sure, on? Sure, I, I can make one. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of school closures and early dismissals and that kind of thing, 
um, the expectation that um, remote learning would be available to students? Is there an expectation that remote learning would be available to students when in this example they left for the day and, and it was not available? So I'm just wondering, um, you know, when we're talking about staff shortages, how this is fitting into the puzzle and, and, and how it relates to what actually happened um, this week. On the Monday? For example, on the Monday when we early dismissed. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't look at uh, instruction on that day just because of that we were kind of scrambling to get out of the building. Um, we didn't look at uh, um, like Google Meets for the afternoon that day. But if we get into a situation like that, excuse me, a situation like that again, uh, we would do that. I I want to um, given the opportunity, I want to point out I think there was a real effort there to try to keep the kids in school. The timing of this. Similar situation happened before the holidays at Ward. It happened with just enough time that we were able to um, get the cafeteria clean, pull in a, a staff from other buildings, um, and get lunch served out to the high school students. That timing, that window didn't exist at, at Woods. And then we had to get the buses scrambled um, because of the midday runs for the elementary schools. So uh, it was at that point that we kind of pushed back dismissal and we, did w we dismissed when we did. Um, but we didn't we didn't look at the idea of um, uh, Google Meets for the afternoon at that point. Uh, oh, and part of that was also based on the fact that we had internet outages. So um, we essentially, because we were not sure that we'd have the internet, it, re it really wasn't something we considered at that point. Sure. No, thank you. I, I recognize that that was a extremely <laughs> um, complicated situation, but one that I can imagine could might unfortunately be replicated in some ways. So I just wanted to make sure that um, that there was an understanding about the if there was an early dismissal that there could be an opportunity for remote learning if the situation was different. Am I understanding that correctly? That's right. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Maskinari. Um, only given our interest, obviously, in trying to keep the building open, um, I definitely understand why, as a district, we have stayed with the 10-day quarantine. Um, that the I don't I don't want to call it a paperwork issue, but the 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 process for trying to go with the seven-day is something that would be very challenging. But it is an option to us if we were able to implement it. Isn't that the case? Uh, it is. I will tell you that. Um our health department isn't comfortable, and I'm not aware of any district right now that's doing it. I think there's a lot of uncomfortability with that seven day. Could you, and, and I don't know anything other than, I thought it was supposed to be two one or two tests in seven days. I don't know if you could explain what it, it is and therefore why we aren't doing it. Um, I, I think that the concern is that um, our, own, our own data, for example, showed, Ms. Clark ran this data prior to the holidays, that our own data showed that the that um, we had, I think, three total cases that turned positive after the 10th day. And that seems to be replicated across the state, that there's relatively very few people who become positive after the 10th day of quarantine. That number starts to shoot up a bit um, at days less than that. So I think that there was concern, because essentially the test is on the fifth day, and then you're waiting for the results. So. I think there's concern from health professionals that that's not an adequate window for the uh, symptoms to perhaps appear and for a positive test to, be n to, to show itself, that that seven days is too tight. So just because cause symptoms are one thing, testing positive is another. Yeah. So that there are, a, it's a significant enough body of data points, to refer to people, of between the seven and the 10 day from exposure time window who are testing positive, forget about symptomatic, but testing positive in that window? That's correct, yeah. S so what, what is the, um, if we did the seven day window, which now, it, now I understand why we wouldn't, how do they implement that differently than a 10 day? I don't know like if I follow what, what are the testing requirements that are different? Um, I'd have to look, I don't remember offhand. It's, it's the, but it is, it's, it's, um, you need the PCR test, I believe, the, the, the more um, reliable test. Okay, thank you. I want to mention just that I have, um, this, this prompted me to remember, and we just sent out a notice to our uh, athletic directors. Um, sports is scheduled to start on Tuesday.
but while we're talking quarantine, it's important to remember that the state, it's, it, I know some of the correspondents have said this is a district rule. It's actually a state DPH rule that if you are an athlete and you test and you need to go into quarantine, the quarantine length of time for an athlete is to participate in sports is still 14 days. You can return to school at 10, but you can't participate in athletic activities for 14. And that's because of the exertion and the close contact and all the other things that go on uh, on the field. So that's a DPH rule and that's in the um, CIAC guidelines as well. May I ask a follow up to that? You may. Um, it, if I'm m remembering correctly, sports also have a requirement of having attended a certain number of practices before you can compete. Are there any allowances or wiggle room if a student has been kept from practicing due to quarantine? I'm not aware of that at this point, no. Okay, thank you. How are we doing on substitute teachers just in terms of are, are we getting more? Do we have more to pull from as we're getting talking about staff quarantines? I appreciate that we can't, you know, staff the building with just substitute teachers, but Ms. DC is rising. I didn't see you back there, Ms. DC. Good evening. Colleen DC, Executive Director for Personnel and Legal Services. Right now, we are uh, successfully filling all of our vacancies that we need to fill. Um, we have a, a great pool of people who are currently college students who we unfortunately might lose in the next few weeks. So at the current moment, things are going well. Um, we hired about 30 new substitutes before the winter break. So. Um, that's usually the amount we would hire in uh, a year. <laughs> we did it in a couple of weeks. Um, so it, it is good for now. Um, we hope it stays that way. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Cummings. Okay, I didn't know if there were any more questions on the woods issue. Any other questions on woods? No, nope, seeing none. All right, the second thing I want to just do a brief follow up on the anti racism um, uh, work. We are, uh, as I mentioned, I believe at the Wednesday special meeting of the board, we are in conversation with the anti-racism committee of the FEA. And then I had a follow-up uh, conversation with Linasia today, the president of FEC, um, to discuss how we're going to organize the work going forward. So this is a preliminary uh, conversation, but essentially what we're looking to do is create a district steering committee um, with representatives from the uh, teachers, the administrators, and the students slash alumni groups um, to coordinate the work going forward. And uh, as I mentioned to Ms. Vitale this afternoon, having a board of ed representative on that group would be terrific. So that's just where we are. Things need to be finalized, but I just wanted to put it out to everybody that that's where we were and to make sure people understood that the, 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 the work continues. Um. Ms. Maskinelli, were you volunteering or do you have a question? Well, thank you, because we were talking that it might be helpful to have someone from the policy committee on that committee. Um, any questions about steering committee? Okay, seeing none. Okay, uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Savichanza if he can come up and talk about the, um, the uh, elementary. He's been working um, with the elementary principals on the June 9th, uh, June, yeah, wishful thinking, Mike. <laughs> The January 19th, uh, 9 to 1 return for the elementary uh, students. Good evening, everybody. James Zavajancic, Executive Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. So I'm just going to go through um, the updates that the principals have planned. Many of these you've heard already and are aware of, um, but just to, to run through them quickly, and then I'll uh, take questions from you. Uh, we built this schedule um, to increase instructional hours in person throughout the day. An example of that is our English language arts block went from our current AB model of about an hour a day combined to um, separate blocks, reading and writing of about an hour a day each. Um, this also allowed us to bring science and social studies uh, to be taught in person um, and also to increase synchronous instruction uh, in the remote portion of the day, including specials and word work and number corners and some other activities that teachers might plan. It also allowed us to have a schedule, one, one schedule across all 12 elementary programs. That would be the 11 on-site programs and the RLA program. Um, five cohorts were made from A1 through C1. 
Uh, those were communicated to parents and will be re-communicated by the building principals this week in their weekly communications, uh, welcoming all five cohorts back to school for 100% of the time, um, starting on January 19th, um, with, with uh, mitigation strategies, including desk shields, uh, three feet distance between students, as well as mask wearing and uh, hand washing as well. Um, Building principals will articulate their building practices for things like recess, uh, snack, and in-person in instruction as well, because some of those vary a little across the district. <coughs> At the current time, or I should say as of this morning, there were about a little more than 40 students in the 11 elementary schools who have elected to be remote only. Everybody else is um, planning on coming back uh, to their classroom with their current teacher. Um, and as I said, schedules and other important information like arrival and dismissal, um, how some different procedures are happening across the 11 elementary schools are going out in weekly communications directed by the principals of each building. Um, nothing uh, else really has changed. We did, um, as you know, take into consideration the recommendation to add recess into the nine to one day, and that is happening across all 11 buildings as well and built into that um, schedule. So I will uh, open it up for any questions. Ms. Asa? Yes, um, my question is related to transportation. Um, so I know in the letter that I got with my cohort assignment for my son, um, it was a long letter and at the very end it was kind of buried in there about checking infinite campus um, for your bus assignment. And one thing that I would ask is if it would be possible to send a blast to infinite campus elementary parents that have an assigned bus route um, maybe this Friday to be sure that they go in and check to find their new times um, because those people there, there's gonna be a lot of differences for people especially that we're in you know PM cohort or whatever um, not only time but bus numbers um, will be changing so I would just ask if that's something that could be done as a separate blast I know we hate getting too many blasts but I think it's very important because we don't want a bunch of kids on the side of the road because they missed their time. We can most certainly do that. It, it was uh, uploaded, I believe, today for parents to check, but it would be a good reminder for them. And then further on the, on the bus routes, um, this kind of goes into the secondary too, but I know um, because of the st staggering where the secondary went to the new schedule a week ago uh, and the elementaries aren't until next week, um, it did cause some collapsing of routes on Wednesdays for the secondary level. Um, can somebody confirm now that once we go back to a 9-1 schedule with elementary, um, how that will affect the Wednesday bus routes at the secondary? Will they be going back to what they were or will they be notified as well? I don't have that information with me at this point. I would have to look it up. I don't know if uh, Doreen or anybody? Zakia Parrish, Executive Director of Operations and Processes. Yes, they will be returning to their normal schedule. This was just um, for the two Wednesdays uh, because of the l delayed start for the elementary return. And, and w is it two Wednesdays? And how, I, I don't have a, a secondary student, so forgive me, but next week's schedule because of Martin Luther King Day, uh, how does that play in? So on all shortened weeks, they're full days of school. So they eliminate the shortened Wednesday schedule at the secondary level on any shortened week. Okay, so tomorrow is the last day of those consolidated routes. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, Mr. Asa? I, I had one, but I can't remember, right, so I think I'm good. we can come back to you. We're gonna go to Mrs. Metzkano. Um, in the uh, spirit of communication, I just also request that there be separate reminders to the parents and to staff regarding the nature of the food in those classrooms. Um, because again, we, we tried to put out there the caution, this is not meant to become minor lunch, um, but just the nature of what they're allowed to have in that classroom. And that staff is respond. I mean, while we, again, we, we did not ask them to read labels, but they are responsible for being cognizant of the food that is in the classroom. And um, if that could go out, it would alleviate a lot of concerns. Thank you. 
Mr. Asa, back to you. Oh, say, sorry, I remembered. So this goes back, um, and Dr. Parrish might need to touch on this, but um, with regard to transportation, um, so because we're going back to a full day, 100% capacity, um, the buses are going to be much, if everyone that's eligible for bus that opted in rides, um, we're going to have more full bus routes. Um, so can, can you just touch for the parents that are concerned about um, will there be assigned seating or are we going back to kindergartners in the front and fifth graders in the back um, and how will that come into play with quarantining if there is a identified positive case? They, they are still assigned seating at this point in the elementary moving forward um, for the reasons you suggest there uh, in terms of contact tracing. Um, whether that be K in the front, I believe it goes by family and then by how you enter and exit the bus in both directions at this point um, with who's on the bus. Okay, so when we're two weeks in, let's say hypothetically, and we kind of get a, a better sense of ridership um, and we have one side of the bus filled and the other side not, will we be re-looking at those seat assignments potentially to try and move kids distance if that's possible or is that a school by school or bus by bus case? I don't know off the top of my head what their um, logistical plan is at the bus company. I'd imagine that they would spread them out uh, to the best to the best that they can um, if that comes up where people are not riding the bus and being driven in. Uh, and I believe they did that in the fall. Yeah, I, I, my, my fear is that the, you know, the numbers that were placed on the rail up and high, you know, where kids could know and they get on the bus and they're told the first day, you know, you're in row whatever, you know, if those numbers have come down or whatever. So I would just urge that if we can, you know, make sure that those items are taken care of so that on Tuesday when the elementary kids get on the bus, if they're going to be told where to go, especially the younger ones, the kindergartners and first graders, that they know where to go. Any other questions? Ms. Pico. I'm not sure if my question is to Mr. Cumming or Mr. Zabinchenko. I, I apologize. So if a student, it's about live streaming. If a student is quarantining, they can live stream into the classroom. Starting on the 19th or currently? Both. So currently, if you are quarantining, uh, in either scenario, if you are quarantining or isolated, you can live stream into the classroom, yes. Okay. But if a parent takes the precaution, they're not told they have to quarantine, the parent takes the precaution to keep their child home, can they still live stream into class? Uh, anybody can be remote and live streaming starting on the 19th um, with communication to the building principal. Okay. Three days notice though, right? To come back, so in the opposite direction, um, if you want to come back and they have to reset up the room, it's three days notice going from remote only to in-person, but otherwise it's a 24-hour period. Um, the building principals, obviously, with enough time, um, can get students to live stream quicker um, if necessary. It really depends on when that message comes in. If it comes in at 8.45 in the morning, it's a little more difficult for the teacher to be able to um, get everything prepared if they're the only student live streaming. Mr. Asa. Sorry, just to keep piggybacking on that. Okay, because I'm, I'm confused because I thought we were told that it was three days on either side because, and the real reason I was saying that is that I understand what Ms. Pitko is saying about taking precautions and everything, but I also understand that the teachers have a tremendous amount of work to do and to have a teacher be responsible and told that in 24 hours notice that they've got to have everything ready to, to send home or whatever. Um, in talking to a lot of the elementary teachers, um, I've come to understand what's involved with that. So um, I, I do have a little reservation about that. Do you want me to respond? Um, the, the work with um, a group of teachers, the union and the administrators was that lessons will be planned and um, able to be delivered to both remote and in-person students um, so that the turnaround for it is quicker. So it was 24 hours that was decided uh, in order to go remote uh, in three days to come back for the, obviously the setup of the room and the other piece is not necessarily for the instructional piece. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, thank you for that question, Ms. Pitko. 
Mr. Cummings, can you just, for the public's sake, if there's a positive case in a classroom now that the distancing is going to be closer, what that might mean, will yeah. mean? Yep, thank you. Um, what it means is uh, what districts who brought students back um, to, a, to essentially a full classroom have found that, and it's particularly in an, in an elementary classroom where there is movement during the day, not, not traditional movement, you know, we're not gonna see kids sitting on the rug or, or doing those types of things, but there's just movement in the room. Um, uh, that essentially what happens now, if a student tests positive, the entire class usually goes out on quarantine um, for that period of time, the 10 days, um, with the teacher included. So um, the teacher may work from the classroom or may work decide to work from home, depending on you know if they're able to work, but the, um, the safest precaution that health districts and district and school districts have found is uh, the entire classroom goes on quarantine. And that has happened, if you think back even to the fall, uh, cases at private schools in Fairfield, that happened as well. And would it be just a classroom or would it potentially be a grade? It should only be a classroom. We had a conversation, I know Dr. Sabachanzik and I, and I know he spoke with the elementary principals, that um, it really should only be a, a classroom. We're gonna be working to separate the students out other parts of the day, recess and out of their opportunities. So there may be some ramifications depending on who the positive case is. If they rode the bus, there could be other implications for other students. But it should only be that limited to that to that actual physical classroom. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Tortelli? So given that, and I understand what you're saying about quarantining the whole class, but you're still going to be sort of strict with the three foot rule and kids staying away from each other in class even though they're all gonna be quarantined regardless? We are gonna be strict with the three foot rule. We're gonna be absolutely strict with the masking. And are they all, do they, are they all using the physical barriers at their desks? They should be, yes. We've bought them for everybody. Okay, all during the entire day, not just Th for snack or. That's correct, right. Any other questions on elementary school? Mr. Issa? Not necessarily just a question, but something that just popped into my head, uh, Mr. Cummings, when you said, um, you know, just the classrooms and stuff. But one thing to take into consideration is um, with aftercare um, going back and, um, you know, the potential contacts with that. So I would just say that it's not an absolute that it's just a classroom because there could be additional contact in the aftercare program. And I guess my question would be, um, you know, would that potentially, if it was a day late, you know, before we found out, would that trickle back to additional classrooms at different grades because of the aftercare interaction? It certainly could. I mean, this, this really plays out. Of course, this could happen now even with some of the circumstances, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Anything else on this? Okay. Um, before we, I ask Dr. Parrish come up to talk about the internet uh, issues, um, I just, Ms. Clark texted me um, to Ms. Maxine Kennelly's question around the 10-day quarantine, so just some clarification. Um, the 10-day quarantine doesn't require a test, so you can come back after the 10 days, uh, but, and you must be absolutely asymptomatic. Um, the seven-day option is test on day five and return on day seven with a negative result. So that's the difference between the two. Dr. Parrish. Zakia Parrish, Executive Director of Operations and Processes, and our uh, Director of Information Technology, uh, Nancy Burns, is going to join us. I'm not sure how the call in is going to work. She's going to call in via WebEx. Yes, we can. We can. Thank you very much, Nancy. How are you going to see director? So, uh, Ms. Burns, can you quickly go through the uh, order of events that took place today with reference to the internet outages? Yeah, over the last two days, um, we've had, I think it's four outages with um, our internet service provider, which is actually the state of Connecticut. Um, you may be familiar because I'm sure over the years you've heard me speak about them. 
Uh, we use the Connecticut Education Network um, as our internet ISP for the schools. We actually have two different circuits um, for that purpose, and they are set up locally um, and directly to them um, redundantly so that we would have backup. Unfortunately, CEN experienced um, a failure with an internet filtering device or system that they have in place. Um, it has redundancy built into it as well. But unfortunately, they had a catastrophic event yesterday that caused um, the filtering basically not to allow any internet traffic to go where it needed to go. Um, it took them a few hours to figure out what was going on. That was the first outage. They thought they had repaired everything. Then there was a piece of hardware that failed the second time that was associated with the same product. Um, they had to take that out of line, and we thought we were doing well. And then, unfortunately, this morning, they had a reoccurrence of similar situation. Um, this is not unique to Fairfield. Um, there are over 180 districts in the state that utilize the same Internet service system um, through the state. We were all in the same boat. Um, we were able to keep our central office up because we use an actual independent uh, system that does not filter um, for the business activities of the district. Um, that did enable us to get communication out to parents um, and, and to our secondary students as well um, and to keep our staff abreast of what was going on. Um, I have to say that we've had the CEN service for, I think, if memory serves, a little over 15 years. Um, we've never had a catastrophic event of this nature. Of course, it would have to happen with um, 2020, 2021. Um, and we are looking at alternatives for uh, basically a fail-safe for us that would allow us to use a different provider, uh, potentially um, failing over to the circuit that we use for central office. It might be a little slower, but it would be better than not having anything um, for our schools. Um, the CEN has pledged to us that we should not see a recurrence, but it's still the year of the unknown, so I can't make any promises. They do feel that they've addressed um, the root causes of the problem, but we thought the same thing yesterday. Um, the timing for us about redirecting and having a, a third um, path to deal with our internet access is good because our um, wide area network contract is going up to bid basically the end of this month. Um, so we'll be able to add that as a potential add-on feature um, to what we're looking for in our bid responses. Um, and I can open it up to questions at this point. Any questions? No questions here. Thank you for uh, that thank, thank the, for the update and the detail on that. And hoping. Thank you, and I, I appreciate your patience and parents and the students' understanding. Um, I talked to one young lady today and and said, you know, it's it's kind of like power going out during a storm. Um, it's a utility, and when they fail, you really feel it. Um, so my thanks to the community for their patience. Thank you. This is Massa Canelli. I mean, is, is there any plan to have this Wednesday with its extra PD time and staff that they come up with any, I mean, unless you really, really believe it won't happen again, but to, for them to devote some time to having a backup plan ready that's already posted, just so that's, I mean, I, I don't know what it was like. My, my child was in school, so. He was in school, so I just left that alone. But um, for everyone who's home, I just th I know what an awful feeling it is when you lose it and you have no way to communicate out. Those students at home are responsible for learning. The parents want them to keep learning. Is there something that the teachers will be instructed to come up with to have as a fail-safe or? I, I can't speak to anything specific planned for tomorrow, but I asked Dr. Parrish to, to check in with our uh, administrators today, and I don't know if you have an update on and what t how teachers handled this and how what we have to do going forward so the majority of our teachers tried to of course troubleshoot what was going on tried to navigate around the issues that we were having with the internet service some of them some of them actually utilized their own personal devices as hotspots so that they could quickly post something to google classroom others um, enlisted the help of their colleagues that were able to post things for them and then there were teachers that were in a situation where they had already posted 
the assignment for that day or, or the students were working on a long-term project so it was something that they were already going to be working on for that particular day so I think because of the fact that it happened two days in a row it really triggered our teachers to be more problem solving and pro problem solvers rather and to start coming up with plans to try to prevent that loss of learning time in the future. Ms. Mescanelli. Um, as a quick follow up to that, not to belabor this point, but the notion that a student is at home working on a long time project having no face time with the teacher, that's not the norm at any point in time, correct? No, it's not that they have no, no connection with the teacher, it's just that that was something that they could continue working on in the event that there was, well, in this particular unfortunate incident, they already had something that they were working on and could continue working on during that time. Thank you. We um, received some questions just about the loss of instructional time over these two days, if there's something just to be concerned about. Uh, are you concerning losing the instructional time in terms of meeting instructional hours? Um, I don't know if you anything to add to that or we can certainly take back to our administrative staff to have conversations with their teachers about making sure that they have have some sort of to miss um, Max Canelli's point emergency plans emergency tasks or, or uh, assignments that can be posted in the event of this type of situation especially this week just given the fact that it has happened twice we hope that it wouldn't happen a third time but uh, who, who knows so I think being proactive and at least having one or two tasks that are you know, related to the topic that they're working on now would be beneficial for them to at least have something at, in the event something like this happens again this week. And just could they send an assignment to central office to send out through IC? Um, they possibly could, we were not Email was working, correct? So that would be the way yes. we would do it. Email yes. was still working. Yes. Anyone that was not at a school was still able to connect and send out emails, and that's where some of the colleagues that came into play in terms of them being able to send something to their colleague and the colleague then post it um, in Google Classroom or send out a blast to the student's email um, with the actual assignment. So, and, and in the case of the RLA, we do have some teachers that teach from the building, mm -hmm. so our EPF uh, was assisting in terms of trying to troubleshoot and get things out to kids in that situation. So there were some instances where people that were not in the school or those that were in the school that had used their personal device as a hotspot were able to get some things out to students um, either via email or Google Classroom. Okay, thank you. Hopefully tomorrow will be a better day uh, for this. Ms. Jacobson. Um, thank you. I just had a quick question. Is there a scenario, Mr. Cummings, in which you know, hypothetically speaking, if this happens earlier in the day where we were unable to actually count that day for a subset of students, but we are counting it for another set of students. Do I oh, you're looking at me that way. I just, <laughs> um, I, I mean, right? I hear you. I, we'd have to. I don't have the, an the I, I have the, I understand the question, I don't have the answer yet, because I think we'd have to play that out in a couple of different ways, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. We'd have to, and somehow, right, how do you make up the day for the students who don't have connection with their teacher, at the same time, you're up against the contractual obligations of the school year, right, of the contract, so you'd have to figure out a way you know, is it, a, is it an extra day in school, for example? We'd have to play that out to see how that would work She's out. She's yeah. asking the question I was asking during policy. Yeah, yeah, we'd have to play that out. Yeah, it's an interesting scenario, and it's not one that, you know, I think the state has contemplated quite well in, in, um, at this Get, point. You just better fix that CEN thing. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Masconelli. Well, um, I mean, and honestly, as uh, you've been hearing this, thinking out loud, but this is, in fact, the essence of the equity issue. I mean, uh, now this isn't one that's predictable by socioeconomic status or by neighborhood, but it's the essence of the equity issue where generally the district position has been, if they can't all get it, none of them get it. So playing that again, hopefully this doesn't happen again, but by that scenario, RLA should have had the day canceled and they alone would have had an extra day to make up as an example. 
if they can't all access it, then that has been the past practice. And just right, but there were there half the students could access it. Except that half of them couldn't. Right, right. But it, again, like there it wasn't like just the RLA could come in. Is what I'm trying to say. And even even the, and I you follow, you asked me that question yesterday. Even I talked to Mr. D'Angelo. Um, some of the RLA teachers who work in the school, who come to school to teach from, did similar things to what Dr. Parrish said. So not all of them, because they were, if they stayed home to teach, they were fine. If they came to school to teach, they struggled, and they had to do some of the backup things. Or they went back home and then taught. So there was some, some impact on those days as well. So yeah, it, it played out in every, I mean, there it, it was a lot of you know, innovative thinking, but it's, um, it's not, we have to come up with a better way to handle these types of things. It goes, I mean, as I was sitting here yesterday morning thinking about this, it was all about the weather cancellation policy again, to your point, right? This equity issue um, and the unanticipation of what this, um, the inability to anticipate how this is going to play out. Ms. Pico? This goes back to the question that I asked during policy. So to Mr. Cummings, wouldn't you treat it the same, say there's a water main break at one of the elementary schools and those students now have to make up the day? If a, if a group of students has to go home for the day and it's like eight o'clock in the, nine o'clock in the morning, wouldn't they have to make up the day now? They it would be the same thing if Ward lost its power and couldn't have school for the day. Right, the, 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 it's not as clean though because when we go back a couple of years and we had the water issue at McKinley, uh, I think McKinley lost two or three days of instruction that year. The teachers stayed home. They didn't come to work. So their um, work calendar was suspended for those three days. They, the teachers, to put it this way, the teachers still owed us three days that the students then made up at the end of the year. In, in the situation over the last two days, teachers are still working. So there's not a day that I can call them back in. You know, it goes back to Ms. Jacobson's point. We'd have to figure out a way, like an, an additional day for those students who were home to come into school to kind of even it out because you can't add a day to the end of the year because the teachers are still fulfilling their contractual obligations for half the students anyway. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's a murkier picture. So for the teachers that stayed in the building, they were teaching. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to understand the issue of they don't have to make up this day because the kids that were in school, even though they didn't have internet, they were still being taught. Correct. It was the students that were at home remoting into the class. They lost it. They lost the instructional time. And else they had a teacher who found a hot spot or got something else. All right. Um, again, let's hope it. <laughs> We'll move on from this. I think that we, we appreciate that we need to have backup plans and prepare for uh, yet again the unexpected. Any other no, on this issue? All right. That conclude, excuse me, conclude the superintendent report. Unless um, there's any other questions. Walter Fitzgerald move. Oh, Walter Fitzgerald move. I'm sorry. Um, um, Mr. Papadour, do you have any, uh, I think you have an update. So I met with the town attorney today and they anticipate closing within the next two weeks. That's great news. Um, Mrs. Mascanelli. So just as a reminder, the schedule from then on out. I'm sorry. The as of the closing, then what? After the closing, so today we brought the Walter Fitzgerald staff through the building to allow them to see it uh, and the principal. They were given some uh, s basic drawings of the classrooms of the building and they're gonna be meeting and discussing what their needs are. They will meet with us and once we close, we can start moving forwards with their needs within the building. So the anticipation is to open in September for the school. I would say um, we have had conversations with Ms. Carrick and the um, Walter Fitzgerald staff, or th through Ms. Uh, Carrick to the Walter Fitzgerald staff about once the closing happens, 
uh, getting the Walter Fitzgerald staff over to visit the building, tour the building. Uh, Mr. Mancusi needs to bring his special educators in there because we need, there's, there's a um, furniture, uh, the ff &E comes with, with the uh, purchase. So there's things that our staff need to go through to identify what might be relevant for our own students. The, um, uh, the Giant Step staff asked that if we're not gonna take anything that we give it back to them so they could donate it to people who might benefit from it. Uh, but as you know, there's a lot of OTPT equipment in there that we need to go through. Um, so we're gonna have to do the building assessment as Mr. Papa George talked about. I also wanna get the district leadership team in there um, just to walk through the buildings, so particularly our high school administrators. So they have a sense of where um, the Walter Fitzgerald uh, campus will be and its possibilities now for other students. Uh, because as you know, one of the goals of our goal is to increase, um, to meet the program capacity there. It's been underneath, it's been below capacity. And we, we need to take a greater advantage of that um, site. So those are all things that would be on our radar, um, you know, in the next month or two. Mr. Papa George, all the inspections and everything were done. There were still some things that were open when um, the project got approved. Yes, the uh, last thing was the uh, building materials investigation. So those have been completed. Uh, there was no surprises in them. We anticipated what was in them. Uh, we will need to do an asbestos management plan just like our other buildings, but nothing unanticipated within the building itself. The other building also was investigated and again, no surprises with what was discovered in that building. Mr. Peterson. I was gonna mention this later, but since you're at the table, um, uh, as, as everyone knows, the Board of Finance has met a couple of times. They, uh, the process went through. Uh, they authorized the appropriation of the funds for the purchase. One of the things that came up in one of those meetings, and I sent you guys a uh, written report about this, was the question about how much of that uh, property would be under Board of Ed control versus, versus town responsibility. Um, Mr. Papajoris got back to me after that, and maybe you can mention that you, you said you've been in, in contact with the town trying to make sure that that's delineated properly? Yes, so I've met with the attorney, attorney Baldwin from the town. We're gonna be meeting with the engineer department so that we can actually put on a schematic of the site uh, for all intents and purposes, a line of delineation of what would be responsible, who, what would be under whose responsibility. I believe my original thought was to allow them to have it all, but I don't know if that would work properly. Um, any, can't put us by hand. Um, any other questions on this? Walter Fitzgerald? Thank you, Mr. Papa George. Moving on to committee liaison reports. Ms. Roselli? SEPTA is having its next meeting on January 27th at 7.30. Um, there will be financial planning in time of COVID, so it'll be assisting special needs families with um, what financial planning looks like for them. So if you're interested, fairfieldseptaorg um, join, follow the Zoom links. Thank you. Ms. Jacobson? Well, it's that time again. It's the 2021 <laughs> legislative session. So um, you will start to see emails from me, I'm sure, with um, matters that pertain to, of course, education or the district and any impact. So, um, you know, just look out for those. And if anything comes up, I'll definitely alert you to it and um, take it from there. Thank you. And I believe Cave's having their legislative breakfast. Oh, is it tomorrow or the 15th? Oh. The 15th. And also, Ms. Jacobs and I were speaking this morning about just, uh, Mr. Cummings, I haven't got a chance to talk to you about this, about just setting up a meeting with our state reps um, just to kind of go over what their priorities are, what our priorities are. Ms. Jacobs and I with the executive directors prior to election day and just kind of got a hit list. Some of that information had been shared with them, but just to kind of reiterate that. Um, so we'll reach out and just try, to, try yeah. to get a date that works for everybody. I just wanna reiterate the, the speed at which I would hope that would happen because there's a limited window in it for to get things in. So just if we can, if we wanna do that, I think it's a great idea, it's necessary, um, but just sense of urgency on that timing. Yeah, we're absolutely absolutely in favor of that. And uh, just to piggyback on that, Cabe covered it on the chair, the board chair call um, last week. 
And just um, funding, of course, is people having questions about, you know, what's going to be coming for possible um, more federal aid for COVID, um, just the ECS formula. I share that, you know, we're concerned about HVAC, just the costs associated with it. It'd be great to see some s support from the state on that. Um, and I would just ask any board members, being that we're going to try to set up this meeting, if there's anything on your own personal list that you would like us to address with the state reps, just please send them to Ms. Jacobson. Thank you. Ms. Pickup? Um, I'll start with PTA Council. Uh, they had a meeting on December 21st and um, started with uh, Molly McHugh, presented the middle school students from their equity group and um, members who are on our reopening committee also shared out. There was a guest speaker, Michelle Saglin, who was, uh, gave a, a presentation on motivating the unmade of unmotivated student and she sent me the slides if anybody would like them I will share them with them um, CES also met last month and they also had a fundraiser an online auction which I participated in and won several things um, they have been sending uh, Mr. Uh, Dumas has been sending regular emails on all of their schools um, the steps that they're taking to protect their students and their staff and also positive case results, un unfortunately. And the next meeting for CES is this Thursday. Thank you, Ms. Pico. Mrs. Gerber? Uh, yes, uh, the Mill Hill Building Committee has changed their meeting days to Tuesday, but luckily uh, they're at six. So I did uh, uh, virtually attend tonight's meeting and uh, it was very brief. Um, Mr. Quinn is always excellent with his very brief building committee meetings um, and uh, really nothing particularly new to report. Um, everything seems to be going along as planned. There were a few minor change orders, uh, some invoices were approved and a brief progress report, but um, hoping to get some more pictures at some point because it sounds like things are moving along. So whenever I get any more of those, I will share them with the board. Thank you, Mrs. Gerber. Um, Roger Sherman building committee is you know, still uh, still going strong they're just they have a hit list that they're just trying to get the p through the punch list the project is pretty much complete they're working on setting a day for the dedication um, and just hoping to wrap that up hopefully you know within the next month or so their work will be completed there was a board of health meeting last night um, as everybody knows hopefully that the vaccine clinics are up and running in the town Fairfield really has been um, a leader on this and just getting these clinics up and running they're on 1B right now for 75 and older. An email went out through the senior center just alerting residents. People can sign up online. Um, Ms. Fortelli probably can speak to this better than I and just in terms of you know, signing up for the vaccines. If you know, I guess what came up is some concerns about just people over 75 who may not be tech savvy and know how to get online to register. Um, so if you have a neighbor, just let them know that, Mr. Telly, why don't you jump in here? You can report better than I can on this. Um, yeah, we, we've been inundated. So I think as of last night, we had 4,000 people register through the town. Um, and they can get their shots, not just here, but you know, anywhere that's available. But um, I believe as of Thursday, um, 211 may be open as a call center for those who don't have access to a computer and need help registering you know over the phone but right now we are asking um, those over the age of 75 to reach out to um, their children a neighbor or somebody who might be able to help them so but we're getting lots of phone calls I did ask about teachers are also in 1B if the health department had a date on when we could expect to see teachers getting vaccinated. They did not have a date that they could share. I asked if there's anybody that the boards of ed could be advocating to and really was just told that it's really the call of the governor who's getting advice from the vaccine committee. But Mr. Cummings, did you hear anything different? If there's something that the board can be doing just to fast track that, um, obviously we wanna get our teachers vaccinated as quickly as possible. Mr. Asa. So is it the district that uploads everybody into the VAM system? That's um, Ms. Lucy is been doing that for the VAMs, yes. Okay. Um, 
just the Board of Health, there's still just DPH, safe DPH is still, um, you know, we're talking about moving forward with bringing more kids back. There's still great concern at the state level just about where the numbers are. I think Mr. Cleary said that we're, our numbers are where they were when we closed everything down in March. Obviously, we've learned a lot more about just the safety measures that can be put in place with mask wearing, but it's still, um, the numbers are concerning, and his feedback was that the next month or so, state B DPH are going to be critical. There's some concerns about this new strain and what that might mean for Connecticut. So it is still very, very important that we wear our masks and practice social distancing when at without and follow all of those those measures that we've all been following for close to a year now. Um, but uh, that's really it. This is really you know, good news that we should be proud as a town for how quickly we are moving forward with the vaccinations. Ms. Max Pinelli. Um, in policy, we, um, we always end every meeting with asking Ms. Deasy what we might expect. You know, if there's anything the district leadership team is talking about or recommending. Um, and so something that may be coming up or not, uh, we just don't know yet, is the issue of the vaccinations. Um, you know, the issue of mandating, the issue of recommending, anything like that. We, there, this, we have not taken any position on it. We had no discussion of it. It's simply the topic. And so that topic might be coming up at our, we, we're not meeting again until February. It could be coming up at that point. And I just alert the board because if you get questions about that, by all means, point them my way so that I can tell them precisely what I do not know and what no one is recommending and what no one is mandating at this point in time. Um, but it simply is a topic that we are aware we might be broaching at that time. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say first that uh, today is my mother's 75th birthday and I did register her for her vaccine today. So uh, yeah, perfectly happy timed. Happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, my uh, board of finance meetings, I, I covered pretty much all the, uh, the updates. Uh, they, they were busy with the Walter Fitzgerald project. Um, finance and budget committee had its first meeting of, of the new year. Uh, I was elected chair. Uh, I'm looking forward to that work. Um, so any questions, comments, or complaints come through me now. Okay, open board comment. Okay, seeing none. Public comment, just for anybody listening who would like to give comment on agenda items, again, you can submit through the form on the website or through the public comment email address. And with that, um, motion to adjourn. Mr. Peterson, second by Mr. Asa. All in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Thank you, everybody.